Right. Hello, YouTube. You fucking nuts out there. You guys are fucking crazy. <laughs> you crazy psychos out there. What the hell's going on? Tearing it up on YouTube. Tearing it up. What's going on, YouTube? You guys are so nuts. That was the new Joe Rogan style intro that we're going to do from now on on the videos because his mm. podcast is incredibly popular. It is true. We got to start emulating the Rogan, the Rogan effect if we want to get bigger. We're going to have to go rogue from now on. Going rogue. So, what's up, you fuckers and maniacs? This is Shitmaster. Hey, what's up, you? What's up, you crazy you, monkeys? Whatever you he fucking says. Psychos. In the intro to his YouTube videos. You, you wild. crazy. What's up, you crazy chimps? Hey, what up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's definitely edgy, but that's kind of why I like them. Yeah. Anyway, hello to everybody. Hi. We are in the second week officially of the Kickstarter campaign. Hi. We're doing it. And we're about to go live, so I guess we'll see. We'll see at the end, YouTube. At the end. Yeah. The end. Hey everybody. What's going on? Welcome to the Twitch stream. It's me. We're both here. Dave and He didn't and, say and his Dan, name and Stan. And, and, and me, Dan. The, I think the last time I was on here with you was when I was in the car going to the airport. Yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah, it's been a crazy... Uh, you got married, you're married now. And yeah. then uh, the Kickstarter, and then uh, all the missing Canada orders that I'm taking care of. And yeah, a whole Dan, lot of stuff. Dan hasn't been here for the married streams. It's true. Where it's life true. has totally changed. Or at it's least true. that's what people tell me i don't know i barely barely recognize them anymore it's because i'm black now i've changed my identity completely yeah black male yep six foot five so we're in the second week of our kickstarter campaign everything's going pretty good we're mm -hmm. uh we just broke what are we are we at 193 yet oh let's take a look well, we're at we're almost at 193. We're at 192.9. Yep. So we're about to hit $193,000 raised on Kickstarter, which is really crazy. So thank you to everybody who's supported the book so far. We love you, obviously. Cream team. You guys are the best. Cream team. And if you haven't checked out the book, you can go to stevelichman.com, and it'll link you right to the Kickstarter. And below the video there, the introduction you can see two preview comics of book one and book two we'll be releasing another preview of book two later on this week and you'll be able to read that it'll be good yeah or you mm -hmm. can just click below this video there is a link to the kickstarter it ends october 31st so make sure if you want a copy that you get it from the kickstarter because it won't be available online after it ends and we we have a small window where you'll be able to get multiple copies on our online store but that'll yeah. be for like a couple of weeks and then it's gone and we Pretty don't much have many intentions november, of going around selling yeah. it to publishers or anything like that november 1st to the 15th there's going to be a brief window where if you want to get additional copies like some people wanted to get some for friends some people wanted to get a few to i'm assuming sell because i guess the first book has been on ebay a lot the past couple of weeks which is funny to me yes uh, but yeah, so if you want to get multiple copies, uh, feel free. They will be available November 1st to the 15th. Yep. So that's what's going on. And, uh, yeah, really crazy first week of the campaign that we pretty much, you know, we're 4,000 away from what we ended with on the last campaign, which is really mm -hmm. amazing. So thank you to everybody who supported us. You beautiful yes. people. We love you. So I've heard, Prem. and I don't know if this is true. Maybe you guys in the chat can tell me if this is true or Dave, if you know about it. Um, I heard that since Amazon partnered their Prime thing with Twitch, you can now subscribe to channels with Amazon Prime That's for right. free, and the channel still makes money from it, but you don't have to pay anything. Yeah, so if anybody out there, if you want to subscribe, but you don't necessarily want to pay us a straight $5 from your account... Is you that true, can, though? Yeah, you can use your... That's, wow. 
if you have Amazon Prime, you have the choice of supporting one channel with your account, and it'll do it with your uh, Prime account. Oh, so, okay, so it's it's one channel. Okay. Yeah, you don't have like infinite supply of money. <laughs> and uh, then yeah, I was wondering how it worked. Amazon will give us the money. So, yeah, that would help us a lot if you um, are interested in supporting the channel or you just want to throw some money at a couple of young men. We're here, and we could use your help. We love you. That sounded like a canned thing we had planned. I just realized that sounded scripted. That wasn't scripted. No, I mean, I don't. you don't care that <laughs> I, much. I was watching Twitch last night on the Easy Allies channel, and I saw a bunch of Prime stuff pop up, and I was like, what is this? And I, I, that's when I learned about it. I saw on the Mega 64 one. Oh, yeah. Shout out to Mega64 for plugging the book. Thank you. Yeah, Mega64 had their podcast, and they put up our book on the screen. Really cool. Signalysis. Just subscribe. Five months in a row. <laughs> you got to be fucking God, joking, Signalysis. That's You're some thick beautiful. cream. Four months. Yeah. Wow. You see, I'm white again. That's how cream you got me. That's crazy. Back to being white again. One of those months we basically weren't even on here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate you. You're beautiful people. Love you. But anyway, yeah, basically uh, we're here now. Kickstarter's a weekend as of today, which is crazy. I feel like I we pretty much stayed up for almost four days straight before the Kickstarter working on everything. And uh, then I slept for almost two days straight Yeah, after it, was, it launched. It was pretty brutal, just that whole... Yeah. Uh, ride to the launch was tick 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 i watched the carnival <laughs> this is so sleep. pathetic i watched all of luke cage in one sitting while answering kickstarter emails on i think saturday wow. the entire the entire show the entire 13 14 hour run whatever <laughs> it is that was the day where i said okay there's like 150 messages in the kickstarter inbox i'm gonna respond to everything and just watch this handsome man fight crime and clean up the streets yeah it's a good show i started watching it with kim i'm not it's really super good. far into it but i'm liking it yeah. so far the soundtrack's think, the best part to me yeah the soundtrack's amazing it's it's probably it's definitely the best they've done it's like this huge compilation thing but um all the stuff that the rizza does for it gives it this really cool like kind of quentin tarantino feel hmm it's really good. The thing I like about the Marvel stuff on Netflix is they like I don't know what the the difference. I guess it's because they have a multi show format where they can do episodes and build characters. But the villains are so much better than in the movies. Like they have Loki who's cool in the movies, but in the shows, like the Kingpin, the Purple Man, and Jessica Jones, like now Cottonmouth and Luke Cage, like all of the villains are so much better. Yeah, like. They're like my favorite reason to watch the shows, like even more than the main characters. I just wish they could get more of that in the movies. Yeah, I think it's just because they can be so defined. They can yeah. go into detail on everybody. It's pretty great. But anyway, yeah, watched all that, answered everything. We're doing the same thing we did last time with the Kickstarter where we will answer every question and every email, uh, usually within a day. I go, you know, I take an hour before bed every night and I answer everything, so... If you have any questions specifically or you want help with anything just reach out we will absolutely get back to you very very fast what did i think of diamondback's costume i don't want to spoil it for anyone who yeah, hasn't watched i it haven't yet. watched the whole thing so but i don't I, even know will, what that is i will say they found an incredibly uh, i don't know they honor his costume from the comics so close to what it is in the comics it's kind of crazy but yeah so, uh, hey, time to draw something. I'm thinking mm -hmm. last time it was Samus. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. What should it be this time? Samus was a good one. Mm. Do you want to stick to Nintendo characters? I don't know. We could take some suggestions from the chat. Yeah. We could do like a Kira version of like Stevie Scissorhands or something. Oh, I thought you said a Kira version. I was like, that's a good idea. A Kira version? A Kira? Oh, no. I, I met the guy from the Kira with the Edward Scissorhands hair, but yeah, we could do that too. 
Yeah, Kira might be good. A Tetsuo. Kira, Kira Steve with his arm shooting out. Yeah, Tetsuo Steve. A Belmont Steve. Belmont Steve could work. Yeah, that could work. A Lino Steve. Captain America mm-hmm. Steve. That would just be Red Skull Captain America. Oh, let's much. do a sho- let's do a shovel knight, Steve. Hey, good idea, Adam's art. Pay tribute to other Kickstarter projects. Big shout out to Waz, who is one of the character designers, pixel artists over at Yacht Club Games. When we were doing the first Steve Kickstarter, I reached out to him for help because a long time ago I did some Shovel Knight fan art and we had started talking and he was a huge help on our first Kickstarter. So nothing but love for the Yacht Club team. So Adam's art, you got it, Shovel Knight. Thanks to everybody else for all the good suggestions. Plus, Shovel Knights are Kickstarter brethren. Yeah. Melvin Chanart just subscribed with a suggestion. Whoa. Melvin, you're beautiful. Thank you so much. You creamed us. Correct. Cream. Um, yeah, Dragon Ball is a good idea, but we'll maybe I mean, do we that can... next time. Yeah, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. So I'm going to start We're going to be plenty, plenty, plenty of streams before this month's over. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to field the chat. I'm just going to start drawing. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> so I'll be reading the chat, everybody. Um, feel free to ask whatever, as usual. Happy to talk about everything. Excited for the Iron Fist Netflix series. I'm probably most excited for that. Like, when I found out they were actually doing Iron Fist, I was so happy. I never thought they would ever do anything with that character. Yeah, Iron Fist is one of my favorite characters ever. Yeah. I'm so happy that they're... I don't. I can't even believe they're doing a Defenders thing, but the fact that Iron Fist even got a show is crazy. And thanks, uh, Hypoth hypothetica sorry it took me a minute thank you yeah we're very happy with the response on the kickstarter thank you to everybody out there who helped us get past our goal so quick yeah it's been a crazy crazy week i mean it's hard to believe it's only been a week yeah it's pretty nuts time like sped up leading up to it and the second it launched time slowed way down Mm mm-hmm so yeah you know yeah if anybody has any questions about anything feel free to go otherwise we're just gonna start talking about random stuff just start meandering so yeah what's happened to you that's been uh i mean i feel like a lot of stuff has happened since you've been on here tons of stuff has happened but i don't i'm having a hard time thinking of any of it I don't know. Saw some elk. Came home. Uh, you're married. Uh, tons of books. Okay, so here's the thing. I don't want to complain, but I have to address it. I have to address it because it's so crazy to me. I knew this was going to happen leading into the second Kickstarter. Like I told Dave multiple times I couldn't sleep last night because I had the same dread. It was this reoccurring scenario in my head that I thought was going to happen, and it's happening where we launch the second book and everybody sees the Kickstarter promotion go out with the thunderclap and they go, oh, I never I never got my first book, right. I forgot I backed that a year ago. And what's happened is uh, like, I don't know, we're up to like 50 now, 50 people or so have most, you know, there's a lot of people in Canada who will get their books. They just got misplaced because they only went out like a month ago, month and a half ago. Um, but then there's all these people from all around the world and countries where the books either got lost in customs or they were stolen or they just disappeared. And it's like, that's what I've been doing full time pretty much since I got back from Dave's wedding, even more so since the Kickstarter launched because everybody was like, Oh yeah, right. I never, I never got that. Um, in some cases, books went to old addresses. Uh, in one instance, a person's house burned down. Um, in another instance, a dog ate two copies of the book, literally, they sent us photos to confirm that. And then there's just a huge pile of international orders that just completely vanished. And, um, so basically I'm walking this, I'm walking this fine line now where 
there's two things you can do when someone's book goes missing because most of these shipped back in June. So the first response is assume that it was stolen or is lost because clearly what June, July, August, September, October, almost five months. You can assume it's, it's probably not sitting in customs somewhere. It was probably stolen or destroyed or damaged or lost. Option number two is you jump through the hoops to try and get them their copy because that saves us money because the thing is, I'm just going to go into the numbers because I like the transparency with you guys. The book, book one, when we started, it was $20. The international shipping, we set it at 15 Turns out the international shipping is closer to 25 but we decided to take a hit because we wanted people to be able to get the book affordably and not have to pay $50 for a book other people were paying 25 So if a book gets lost going to a country, we're out the $45 that the person spent on it, number one. And then when we send the replacement, we're out another mm, $55 because to send registered mail with USPS to a foreign country with tracking, it's about $35 a parcel plus the $20 book plus whatever else they got if they got anything else. So basically you have to decide, do I give the person a refund because it's, you know, it's, it, it adds up so fast if you're doing multiple lost parcels or do you just keep sending books and so far, I've just been sending books, tons and tons and tons of books, because I want everybody that backed the book to get the book. But I mean, hopefully this slows down because we're gonna we're gonna run out of books. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I don't That's... know. It's uh, I, I I thought in my like darkest nightmares that international shipping would be as bad as everybody says it is going into doing a Kickstarter, but it it definitely lived up to it. It's it's pretty bad. Um, the sad thing is, is there's not really any alternative because if we were to use FedEx or UPS or something, we'd have to charge people like $45 shipping for a book. Yeah. Premium shipping international is so expensive and it just comes, it gets down to the point of like, it's more of a gamble of if we choose this, they might get there, but we're not going to sell any books. And if we, you know, if we do take the risk and pay and have it be like a little cheaper but still you know it's still like the international mail whatever it's like we run the risk of losing a bunch so it's like which one is the better option i don't know i mean we'd rather more Mm -hmm. people read the book Mm -hmm. so yeah that's basically where we're at now so I wish I could find a more reliable way to get stuff out for the second volume but like i i can't think of anything and like Canada Post, I know I keep saying that we're delaying the audiobook because of Canada Post, but it's true. Every day, you can even see on the main page comments a few people have left stuff from Canada. But I'm getting like, you know, between five and ten people a day um, since we launched the second campaign going, oh, yeah, I, I don't know where my book is. And I don't know if anyone's had any uh, <laughs> experience dealing with the post office before, but tracking down something with a registration number international when you have to do multiple of those a day it becomes a full-time job very quickly it's uh but yeah i mean hopefully it ends soon i mean statistically it has to end within the next week or so because there we can't have lost more than 10 percent of the books it's I mostly hope. something <laughs> like, like there's there's seriously something going on in canada because yeah. the thing is is that here in the U.S., we sold just under 6,000 copies. I'm pretty yeah. sure it was something like that. Mm-hmm. And um, so 6,000 copies got delivered pretty much perfectly. Like, we had a super low rate yeah, of lost lo- books in America. The lost domestic orders with Amazon was maybe 30 books. Yeah, and so out of out like... Out of 6,000. Yeah, out of 6,000 is pretty amazing. So then you look at international. So international everywhere except for Canada. So they all ship out, and like we still had a pretty high success rate. It wasn't like... Out of... So yeah, out of... I don't know how many are coming that I haven't heard from yet, but of all yeah. the international orders right now, I've sent replacements to maybe mm, 30, 35 people. Yeah, so now we come to Canada, and, okay, so I forgot to mention, international, we had, like, I don't know, like, 1,800 books. Yeah, 18, so 30 out of, domestic, 30 out of about 6,000, well, a little less. Yeah. 30 out of about 5,000, 
international, 30 out of 1,800. Canada, there's 500 already... Books. 500, 500 books is all that shipped in Canada. We've already lost over 50. Yeah, it's amazing. It's, <laughs> it's like... Crazy. 10% of all the books that went into Canada are not accounted for. And yes, it, it hasn't been that long since they shipped, but everyone who got their book obviously got their book because tons of people in Canada got them. And I know where they shipped from. They shipped from upstate New York. So you would think people in Quebec and Montreal got their books very quick because it's only a three-hour drive. There's a lot of people in, in Quebec and Montreal that didn't get their books yet. So, And the thing that sucks is, this is the thing that sucks with Amazon too. So if anyone's thinking of doing a book in the future, this is information you should know because this is very pertinent. You're going to take a loss no matter what you think because – if you lose a book with Amazon International, they will refund you what Amazon deems a hardcover book to be based on averages and statistics, which means that for every lost book we lose internationally with Amazon, the maximum we can get back is about $11. That's the maximum. So if you pay shipping internationally with Amazon to send the book like we did based on our book size and weight, it was about $24 a book on average international. So plus the cost of the book, that's $44. You're getting less than, I don't know, maybe exactly. I think you're getting exactly 25% of your costs back, um, from Amazon. You're not getting a full refund. That doesn't exist. Um, with Canada post now, there's two options you can do when a book disappears. Number one is issue a claim with Canada Post, and what they'll do is give you back the declared value of the book, which means I would maybe get back $8 a book or something. It, it wouldn't be much. I'm not going to get any of the shipping price back. Um, they're not going to refund that. And then the other option is just send people a second book and hope for the best. And it's like, if you're not making enough money back to have it be worth your time because the time it takes to issue a claim and stay on top of it and make sure they research it to get your book back is so much time when you're dealing with 50, 100, 200 missing books that it's a full-time job. And it's not worth my time to do that, to only get back like, you know, 10 bucks a book. That's what, $500, $800 total after a month of staying on top of them. And then I have to send out replacement books anyway. Cause they're only going to give me a refund if the book's gone. So why even do it? So yeah, it becomes more of a <laughs> loss to actually look into it. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. So like I'm handling it. Like all the books that people have sent me saying, Oh yeah, this is missing. They're going out. They're going out at a pace I can handle. So some people's haven't been sent yet, but they're going out regularly. A little more go out every day. Um, Hopefully, with what I have left, I think every remaining book that has to go out will go out by the end of this week. I just ordered some new label paper, so that's the one thing I ran out of. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens. But that's the crazy thing to consider if you're going to do a book is it's not worth the time to initiate a claim on all the missing copies because you're not getting anything back that's worth it. You're not getting a substantial amount of money back. If I got a full refund with the shipping refunded, absolutely. But otherwise, it's like it's eight bucks. Just send a new book. Yeah, yeah. there you go. If anyone has any other questions about anything regarding that mess, <laughs> I'm happy to talk about it. To uh, anybody who's wondering, this is Shovel Knight Steve. So mm -hmm. shout out to Yacht Club Games, you beautiful Kickstarter people. We love. And if you, you haven't played Shovel Knight, what are you doing? It's a great game. Great game, great goddamn game. Um, question, Dave. Question for Dave. Any plans for a new tutorial coming up anytime soon? Suggestion: Humans. While I'm aware the previous painting tutorial covered the basics and the process, a tutorial on this would be nice. I mean, like, I get what you're saying. It's just super funny to say humans. <laughs> Suggestion. <laughs> humans. Yeah, nah, I get it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be so specific like that. But because um, the thing with that is that, like, it's fundamentals. You know, like, a tutorial based on, like, human anatomy. It's not something I'm a master at, so I wouldn't feel super comfortable going into it like it's such a fundamental thing that you're going to need to study 
over and over it's not something anybody can give you like the you know this is the keys to the car go drive like it's something you kind of have to learn through repetition and you know right pushing yourself i can't really it, it would be me saying that over and over and just being like this is how i do it and you know i've been doing this for a long time so that's why it's easier for me mm-hmm I'm going to plug in the chat if anyone's interested. This is our new Kickstarter, Steve Litchman, Volume 2. You can get the first book with it. This is a plug. This is a shameless, disgusting, filthy plug. Oh, I but plug seriously, all the time in the last stream. If anyone's listening and you want to help out, even if you can't donate, honestly, the best thing that people can do is get the word out about it by sharing it around and stuff because... You know, we haven't, we're, we're selling the books mostly to people that already have the first book or that missed it the first time, but we really want to like grow the audience, get more people to see it, you know, because after the last Kickstarter, we got hundreds, maybe actually it was thousands because of the mailing list. Yeah. We I got mean, I can thousands. tell you straight up numbers as we started a mailing list after the last Kickstarter ended. And Strictly for we people got, that missed it. Yeah. Just for people who missed the first book and wanted the second book together you know like this is can, this can be both of them but uh it was ten thousand people total for that mailing list so uh a lot of people didn't see the email we sent out and we don't want to pester people so we're just sending emails out with updates but if you could i mean it would mean seriously it might seem like it's not much but everything helps if you want to mm -hmm. share the kickstarter or you know share any of the comics anything like that we'd really appreciate it Yep. Yeah. Yep. Steve Lichman dot com. So yeah, if you share it around, help us out because I know it's going to happen again after the Kickstarter comes down. We're going to get another three thousand emails of people being like, "I just found out about this," and it's like, yeah, you know, we're going to have to wait till the next one. So we'd like to get as many people on board as possible because we just, I mean, got to put this out there again. The only way to get the books is through the Kickstarter. This isn't a Kickstarter to buy stock in the books. This is a Kickstarter to yeah. pre-order them so that we can then have them printed and shipped to you. But we don't and have this, the kind of capital to actually buy a huge amount of stock. This isn't the kind of thing where people get their thing published on Kickstarter and then they sell it to a publisher and it comes out in retail stores either. Mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not doing that. You can only get them from us. Yeah, I mean, like we're just so, two dudes doing this. It's yeah. just two of us. So they're, it's not like they're going to show up in Barnes & Noble in a year. It's, you know, it's not going to happen. Nope. Question for Dan. Do you have any sites that you post your most recent artworks on apart from Steve? Personal pieces, old client work, etc. cetera. Uh, I don't right now because all the work I've done for the past two years, literally all of it, has been for Kickstarters. And um, part of the contract on those is that I usually can't show it. So, for example, Mears Miniatures, I do tons of work for them. I've probably done, I don't know, 300, 350 pieces in the past two years for them, uh, designing miniatures and altering existing miniatures. But I can't show that stuff on my website till way, till, till basically till the figures come out, which, you know, if you fund a miniature Kickstarter, sometimes the figures don't come out till two years later. So I don't show any of that. Another one is uh, like the coasters thing, the RPG coasters. I did like 30 of those. I'm doing a new set of those for the guy next month. Um, I can't, you know, I couldn't show those when the Kickstarter was live. It's basically just I fell into this weird niche of freelance where I'm only working for creator driven projects now. I don't know how that happened, but that's just what happened. Um, so, yeah. Eventually, uh, maybe later this year or next year, there's going to be a huge archive of tons of stuff if I ever get around to putting all of it up. But at that point, I might not even want to show it. So I don't know. Uh, yeah. That is the nature of things. Yeah, unfortunately. By the time I'm able to show it, I probably won't want to show it. Yeah, years. Years vanish. <laughs> yeah. And then there's all the other... I've talked about this in here before. A lot of the work I do for Kickstarters is altering other people's stuff because uh, they want to save, you know, miniatures freelance. The thing that costs the most money isn't hiring the artist. It's hiring the sculptor because clearly that's a lot more work and you have to cast things. 
And um, a lot of the work that I do for miniature Kickstarters is altering existing miniatures to look like something else because it saves them money on, number one, hiring an artist to do an all-new piece, and number two, completely recasting something that already exists. So they'll be like, you know, we have a tree guy. We want to turn him into a different kind of tree. Or like we've got an ogre. We want to turn him into a cyclops. We've got a guy with swords. We want to make him axes and change his armor but keep the body the same. I do a ton of that, and the reason I don't, I ever want to show it is because, you know, whatever percentage of the pieces left over after I edit it was somebody else's work. A lot of it, uh, when I worked for Mears is, uh, Steph Kapinski's and it's like, I don't want to show a piece in my portfolio. That's 30% Steph Kapinski's work. You know what I mean? Like that's morally kind of weird. And it's I, like I don't a, know. It's like a tailor showing off his tailoring abilities. Yeah. It's really strange. It's and it's specific. sort of like, yeah, it's like, it's that weird thing we always used to talk about where no matter what you do, if you're broadcasting it, you'll find a job doing something like that. Like I got these jobs because I was doing paint over live streams and I never in a million years thought that doing paint overs would lead to paying jobs, but it absolutely did. I get paid to edit other people's work so much now. It's pretty much my entire income aside from Steve. But yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Can you tell us why visit Florida is terrible? Uh, I mean, it's humid. It's real sweaty. Uh, there's there's like swamp bears down there. There's uh, alligators. Swamp bears. What are you talking about? There's like these bears that live down there in like the Everglades. These really specific like swamp bears. Like gross brown bears that live down there. Yeah, they all like sweaty. I mean, they're like all wet and moist and gross because it's so humid. Yeah, Ew. it's pretty gross, man. I'm telling you. But uh, yeah, I mean, basically, I don't know. There's like poison snakes, tons of poison snakes, tons of insects that are gross. I mean, some good stuff in Florida, too. But I mean, I don't know. Those are the reasons I wouldn't go. People want to know about the Avenging Angels, Dan. I can't do that. Why not? Don't make me do that. Not even a little bit. I can't remember 30% of that story. That was so long ago. It's part of the Raphael stream. Was it? Yeah. Back when I was uh, drawing Raphael. Does that exist? I don't know. I don't know if somebody I remember, has that stream. I remember my uncle and my cousin. I remember the Avenging Angels part. I remember him getting baptized in the horse trough. I remember him lying and saying he was part of Michelle Obama's motorcade and kidnapping my oh, retarded cousin. I remember that, yeah. All right. Yeah, I remember lots of parts of it, but it's such a huge story because I remember that was a three-part thing. Uh, there kept being new developments in it, and we talked about it over three streams. I can't remember all of it, so I don't want to tell it wrong. That's the thing. So, yeah. Yeah, my uncle did, uh, my scam and uncle, if anyone's ever listened to previous streams, I got this uncle who uh, has pretty much been kicked out of the entire family. And that's saying a lot because my father has, you know, 14 siblings. So, and they all have kids. So it's a huge family. He's basically been completely and totally kicked out of the family because he scammed absolutely everybody for so long and lied and has all these illegitimate kids. And like I have cousins I've never met that live around New England because he, you know, he had kids with people and ran out and ditched him. And he lied about who he was, gave fake names. So we'll never know how many kids he has because he lied about who he was so many times. He's the one, if anyone listened to previous streams, that... He ended up working at my dad's restaurant and got in charge of inventory and ordered way too many hot dogs so he could steal the hot dogs and open up hot dog carts all around town and have my dad pay for the inventory of his hot dog cart business. Tons of stuff like that. His hot dog cartel. He, yeah, hot dog cartel. Huge piece of shit. Terrible, terrible guy. Um, but anyway, uh, about six years ago, I'm not going to tell the whole Avenging Angel story because I'd honestly have to call my parents and ask them to walk me through the chronology of it, which maybe I'll do so I can tell it again. But basically, after scamming everybody for 30 plus years, he tried to get forgiven and my family being dumb said that the only way they would forgive him is if he got his sins forgiven and was baptized. 
So they're of the mind that this guy will completely change everything about who he is and what he's been doing for 30, 35 years if he just gets baptized, because God would never let him do it again, obviously, if he's baptized. So (laughs) I don't know, (laughs) whatever, believe what you want to believe. But (laughs) it's just... He chose to get baptized by a cowboy preacher who (laughs) baptized him standing up in a horse trough. And there's like photos of this online that exist of like, I can't like, it's a gimmick, like cowboy preacher baptizing him in a horse trough. And it's like, if it's that sacred that you're thinking it's going to totally change a person, why does it have hokey gimmicks attached to it? Like a fucking theme park. Like how can those two things exist at the same time? Like it's this devout, He's going to change and God is going to save him. And at the same time, it's like, get in that horse trough, fire up the fiddle. Like, fuck you, Dan. It's fun and festive. You can go (laughs) fuck yourself, dude. Yeah, fun and festive. You piece of shit. Yeah, I guess. So anyway, he got his sins, he got his sins forgiven and was welcomed back into the family. And lo and behold, what happened after that was he started lying to my cousin who's mentally challenged about seeing angels and God talking to him and that the two of them were chosen for great things and that they would be like angels on earth that did things for God. And my cousin who was mentally challenged obviously couldn't hear the stuff God was saying. He had to trust my uncle on it, but my uncle wouldn't lie. He got baptized. You know, clearly he's telling the truth. So then he basically effectively kidnapped my cousin without kidnapping him by saying we're on a mission. And you got to come with me. So he came with him of his own volition based on a lie. So it's not kidnapping, but it was basically kidnapping. Nice kidnapping. And then they went all over, all over, all over Indiana, Illinois, Kentucky, scamming and scamming and scamming and scamming. And at one part, he said he was part of Michelle Obama's advance guard and the motorcade and they had to shut off all the security cameras in a store and everything that he was clearly going to rob because they didn't, you know, they had to, cause the she FBI was going to come in and whatever. She, yeah. She was going to drive by and come in and like, you know, we got to shut these off and make sure no one's in here. And like, you know, you're gonna have to let me go through everything in your back room to make sure there's no guns in here because anything could be hiding in here and just like stealing everything in the process. Like, you know, and he's got the charisma to pull that shit off. He's been doing that since before I was born. So clearly, you know, they ended up going on this massive, huge thing. And it ended with the state police from a bordering state uh, stopping him as they were trying to escape. And I don't know what happened to him after that because no one knows what happened to him after that. He went off the grid again, as he usually does. But until I have all the facts and chronology in my head, I don't want to tell the whole story because I will get it wrong. It's a huge story. So I'm sorry, but yeah. I mean, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's yeah. a good, you know, a good teaser. run through. There you go, run good, through. It's a good teaser. I like it. It's <sighs> dope. Dope mm-mm, story. Mm-mm, mm-mm. So nothing else happened. I feel like things happen. Stuff happened. I saw a stealth bomber the other night. You did. You called me right after. Yeah, you said a big silent shadow flew over you. Yeah, the other night I was out walking walking my dog and uh I saw a giant triangle with three super super dim lights fly over my head and it just like blocked out all the stars and didn't make a sound. It was pretty good. Mhm. I never seen one before. I mean, I don't I don't know if it was like a stealth bomber, stealth bomber, but it was a big triangle, so I'm just going to assume. And it was just, just yep, yeah, right through the night. There you go. Didn't even make a sound like that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Sound effects are the opposite of silent. Inner Heaven asks, how many series of Steve Lichman are now available, and how many is planned to create? Are you going for some new work besides Steve? Well, we have two volumes available. One is 252 pages long, and the other one is 400 pages. So you can go to stevelichman.com. L-I-C-H-M-A-N and you can check out the Kickstarter there. It's only uh, 30 for the book for volume 2. So, yeah. Check it out. Mm -hmm. And you can get volume 1 there as well. They're hardcover books. They have gold foil pressed. They're cloth. They're really nice. foil. We're self-publishing the book ourselves. It's just Dan and I. We do Mm -hmm. all of this alone. So, we don't have help from people besides like you know, the people in China printing it. <laughs> mm-hmm. But 
yeah, that's what's up. So that's what so, we yeah. have available right now. And uh, uh, we're going to be doing more of that. We're going to do book three, and then we'll probably do something else too. Seek a Mart. Uh, yes, we do read this chat. We will answer whatever questions, and we're happy to talk. La Beef so, asks, yeah. did you tell the suit story? I don't know the suit story. Oh, the suit story is when that kid disappeared. When I went back to get the, uh, when I went back to get the, what was it, the vest? Or something? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and I don't know what happened. I should go back to the big and tall tomorrow uh, when I go get coffee, and I should ask whatever happened with that because they said the police might call me, and they never did. Right. I forgot about that. Yeah, right. That story has no ending. So that's, uh, yeah, who knows. Really weird, though, that that kid would just disappear alone and lock the whole store and then have the store broken into the next day. So clearly someone was looking for that kid. 100% positive he's dead. Yeah, that sounded like a drug debt or something. That sounded... I feel like I've seen the TV show where that happens to somebody, so I know what it is. But, yeah. All right, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He might not be dead. His legs are broken, though, for sure. His legs are fucking broken. Yeah, his legs are broken. What a pussy. I would never let my legs get broken. Mm mm mm. Dave, did you make that brush? Uh yep. I mean I altered a brush. I d I don't even remember where it came from. It was in a brush pack prack. Right. In a brush pack. And I altered it to be more uh I don't know. I guess I just shut off some settings so it wasn't like it didn't have that opacity thing going on. Right. I don't know. I think. Hey, uh, truly epic. Thank you. Whenever, if anybody wants to get the books later, that's, that's you know, it's up all month. And then there's a two-week window afterwards. And, uh, yeah, thank you. And then that's your last chance. That's it. So me and Dave were talking about this earlier, actually, and I'll just bring it up now because why not? Uh, we're going to have to start, like, going to cons and stuff and figuring out how to wheel in thousands of books to sell books at cons. Because if we're only offering the books bundled together, we can't get to book three and be like, and you can get book one and book two packed in for a hundred dollars. Like we, you know, well, eventually and then it's shipping is outrageous. It's going to be insane. Yeah. So, you know, when the next book comes out, hopefully next year, uh, it's going to be a three book trilogy pack and it's going to cost a shitload to ship it, especially international. But the price is going to be it probably what 70 bucks at least book one's going to be 25 book two is going to be 30 book three is going to probably be 30 again because it's probably going to be 400 pages. Yeah. Um, based on what we've already written. So like. It's going to be like a $100 tier with shipping. It's just, uh, yeah, we got to start finding ways to be able to sell the first books on their own. I don't know. Maybe cons, uh, something. I, I'm just, we're going to have to buy dollies and rent a van because wheeling that many books into a con is going to be crazy. Hold on a second. Jumpman brings up a really good question. What are Wicked Tough's thoughts on backyard wrestling? Will he be a character in the Federation? Yeah, hundred percent. We actually have uh, funding, and uh, we're starting up our backyard wrestling federation. Rip saw reposes backyard beatdown. Yep, and uh, I'm wicked tough. We're gonna start it up. It's gonna be this big event. You're gonna be able to come out to Denver. We have a field. It's kind of deserty. Every field out here is deserty, and you'll be able to see us in person. We'll be signing books in between wrestling after we simmer down from our personalities, which are like a heightened version of ourselves. Yes. But tickets are going to be expensive. You can believe that. Um, I don't yeah, it's know going to be this... going on for three summers in a row. Three summers in a row. The three season beat down. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know what this question is. Um, is it McNulty from Shadi Safadi by any chance? Is that a brush question? McNulty just makes me think of the wire. I have no now I want to watch now, now I want to watch the wire. Uh, see, Kamart, I don't know what that question is. Um, we know who Shadi Safadi is. We know who McNulty is from the wire. Uh, I don't know what the question is though. If the question is, do I have a Shadi Safadi brush? I do not. I've never downloaded his brushes. I didn't. Know Unless that. his brushes have someone else's brushes in them that you already have. True. There you go. <laughs> 
which cons do you guys plan on going to? Anything in specific? Uh, I'd like to go to New York Comic Con again, but I hear it's getting incredibly difficult to get in, so I don't know. Um, they're actually turning artists away from Artist Alley now because it's at capacity. So I'd like to go there. Uh, we probably wouldn't be in Artist Alley if we're selling books. They'd probably put us on the show floor, which, you know, whatever, that's fine. I like Artist Alley a lot, but it is getting, especially after the last time I went, it's getting ridiculous. And it is in um, an airplane hangar. Yeah, it is separate from the con and a detached hangar. Um, I don't know. Where do you want to go? Well, we're definitely doing Denver, or at least I am. Oh, yeah, you're 15 minutes I'm away. I'm in Denver, yeah. so that's going to happen. Uh, I'd like to do Chicago, C2E2. Um, I don't know. I mean, whatever we can handle, because we do need to start being out in public promoting the book talking to people hanging out but we just haven't had time because we're just going book to book to book to book it's like Mm -hmm. you know this is our this is our run it's not i mean not to brag but here it comes it's not often that you know you have like time between doing a book like that it's like 400 pages and then you know the next book's 400 pages so it's just like it's just physically impossible to like leave your desk. Yeah. You just yeah, wouldn't get it much. done within a year. Um, let's see. If I don't have volume one, should I still get volume two? Uh, well, we packed them together on the Kickstarter for people that don't have both so they can get both because, you know, it is a continuation of the story. Like there's, there's issues that stand alone that work on their own where you don't need context or story to, to get the joke and stuff. But a lot of it is continuation of like character development and story stuff from book one. So we recommend getting both. Um, we priced it in a way where you can get both hardcover books, 650 pages total hardcover, uh, for basically $50, which is the price most hardcover books start at on Kickstarter. We're way below what the, um, we're way below what the platform prices hardcover books at. So you can get two hardcover books for what most, you know, 150 page hardcover books cost on Kickstarter. So, and we control all the quality. So it's super high quality. Yeah. Hopefully it's affordable. Yeah. I mean, for what it is, you're, I mean, like you just can't find a book that's made the way that it is for anything less or even close to what we're charging. Since we're just two guys, we don't have to pay all of the fees that you would have to pay had you published a book through a major publisher using the same materials we use and everything because then you have to pay the retailer costs, the shelving costs, the shipping costs, all the distribution, not to mention the printing and then everybody else who needs a cut in publishing. So that's why we're able to charge what we charge. Uh, someone said go to Spectrum. Is Spectrum still just like a for artists by artists thing? Is there like a comic scene there? I mean, we, yeah. I mean, it'd, it'd be nice to go there, but it's not known for comics. So, I mean, we wouldn't I don't be think selling comics. I mean, we wouldn't be selling regular art, really. It'd be weird to be in the sales area there, where like a bunch of fine artists and illustrators selling oversized prints and originals, and have a bunch of hardcover books. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. I haven't been to spectrum and I know it's changed gradually, uh, each year. So maybe it's, it's different than what I think it is now. Um, Chicago. Uh, yeah, that might be cool. Is there a way to get Steve Lichman audiobook on vinyl? There is, you have to take the MP3s and put them on vinyl. <laughs> you, you, I absolutely encourage you to do so. I'd be very happy if you did it. That's the, that's the easiest way to get them on vinyl is to put them on vinyl. And specifically message us about the warmth. Yes. Tell us that the... Oh God, I don't even want to get into it. So, so you can really feel it like a tangible object. That the, You know, the music is just, you know, something about the, the warmth of the needle and the scratch just gives it a fuller body. Well, it's an experience. Well, it's, it's an experience. It's a it's physical It's not thing. an album anymore. An album, you mm-hmm. know, it should be an experience. You should listen to the thing the whole way through. You should live it. You know when I, I mean? listen to it digital forces files, you to live it. I'm not done. It's so, it's so I'm not sterile. done though. When you, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. When you listen to it on an album, you get to go. You know, you, you're sitting down. You have a glass of wine. 
You have uh, what do you eat with wine? Nuts? No, you have cheese. No, no cheese. cheese. And meats. Uh, cured meats. Oh, actually, I mean ours is a story, so maybe vinyl is the way to do it. Yeah. Shit, dude. Six hours on vinyl though would be what four vinyls? Be a lot. Be a lot of vinyl. Oh my god, you're right. <laughs> be a huge amount of vinyl. Uh, let's see. Uh, serious question, Dan. Have you potty trained Dave yet? Or is he still shitting his pants on stream? Well, actually, I haven't checked in with Dave about how much leakage is coming out of his rectum in about five or six weeks now. Are you still having a problem with that? Or is the probiotics kicking in? Well, I don't take any biotics because I don't you think stopped. they're natural. Uh, oh, I see. Although I do still like eating morning custard. AKA yogurt. Bad idea. Uh, for the biotics. No, I, I haven't had a, a leaky asshole in a while. Um, I don't know. I haven't been eating that many nuts. So you haven't gone to the bathroom and already been wet down there in a few days? No. Okay, good. You were having a problem with that over the summer. I just, you know. This what? isn't unfounded, but people are asking you. This is clearly a thing you went through. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just like, it's kind of in the air in the summertime. You know what I mean? That sure. It's like the, the, the heat, the the amount of dampage down there. Get some cashews packing away for fall. Yeah. And I snack on yeah. the shoes and then... Snacking on shoes. And then, you know, I just spring a leak a little bit and it gets yellow. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I did talk about piss driblets on the toilet seat. Yeah, those are always a And how everybody can relate to them when they freeze and they're stuck to the seat forever as a dot. Yeah. And how those are the things that you need to do when you're making a book. It's true. It's things like that people can relate to. Keep that in mind. Dribs. Really humanizing piss driblets. And mud butt. That's mm, right. Mud Lviv. butt. I could talk about mud butt for years. Mud butt. I don't know. The way I think about mud butt when I hear that word is I think about like a combat boot sinking into somebody's ass and just like ripping the skin of the ass like a old cup of milk that's been sitting there. Like, you know, mm. when you like when you <laughs> puncture the skin on the top right. and then it sinks into brown, like everything below your butt skin is brown like mud. You know what I mean? I feel like the mud butts were a team that went rogue in Vietnam and never came out of the jungle. They did terrible things that they can't disavow. They're called mud butts? Yeah, the mud butts. That's just too fun. Like he went mud butt. Like a military, like he went mud butt. He's not coming back. He went mud butt? Yeah. That's what I'm picturing. I don't know why. That's just what I'm picturing. He went mud butt. He went mud butt. What is that usually called? I don't know. No, you're, you're saying it, but it's not mud butt. Oh, a a wall. A wall. A wall, yeah. He went A wall. That's so Muddy far from stuff, mud butt. No. And then you get into fucking Harry Potter stuff, mud, mud blood, and it's like I'm picturing some British dude with a wand saying mud butt now, and it's like, I don't know, it's too close. Mud butt, Vasiliosis. Yeah. I knew a kid named Vasilios. He uh, was Greek, and my mom said. I told you about this kid when you were here. Mm -hmm. And this kid was, you know, pity invited to my birthday when I was little. And I never forgot him. It was him and his little brother. And they were Greek and they didn't speak really any English. Everybody made fun of him in school. My mom was like, you just invite him to the birthday. I was like, but mom, I'm a little kid and I hate everyone who isn't cool. Mm -hmm. It's embarrassing. And she was like, yeah, but listen. I was like, ah, cool. So then they came to my birthday and they ruined it. They jumped on their mom's car on the hood of her car and then jumped on my mom's car on the hood. And uh, they were screaming and freaking out. And I was like, do you see, mom? They're losers. They're fucking losers. And uh, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes it's not worth giving people... uh, the time of day, I guess. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. Was wondering where you were going with that. 
I, I, I'm trying to figure out what the moral is, and I keep trying to like dig for it, but I don't know. Don't if there listen. Is one. Don't listen to your parents. Don't let immigrants in the country. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's the. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it is. That's the one right there. Someone on the Kickstarter said that they thought I was being racist because I said shipping stuff to Africa is a gamble. I said, mean, I guess. What do you think? All black. <laughs> you said you think all black people steal or something. I was like, You're yeah. Like, no, I... <laughs> I made an offhand comment where I was like, well, I mean, I could send you a third book, but I mean, like, it's kind of a gamble sent to, you know, African customs. It's kind of notorious. And they were like, I don't think you meant that to be as offensive as it is. And I was like, it's, it's just a fact. It's not offensive. Like, <laughs> there's a list of countries when you go to the post office where they're like, are you sure you want to send that? Okay. I mean, we'll see what happens. Oh, let's see. I've already have book one and I've backed book two. Any way I could back for just the book and the foil poster? No, and the reason we did it that way is because if we came up, because other people are asking if they can just get the cards and other people are asking, can I just get, you know, this comp- can I just get the bookmark and the poster? Can I just get the cards and the audio book? It's like the way, the reason we didn't do that is number one, if we did a tier for every possible combination, we'd have like 40 something tiers and that's just not doable. And then the other reason is, is because when you do add-ons on Kickstarter, it becomes a complete and total shit show. And the reason that is, is because people just add what you tell them to, to their pledge to get the thing. But then if you have, you know, 7,000 people back your Kickstarter, which is close to what we had last time, what you have to do then is go through every single order and figure out exactly what all of those people got. And that's not the hard part because we could do that in a couple of days if we really tried. We could absolutely do that. The hard part is sending that spreadsheet of 7,000 custom orders to your team in China and hoping, hoping against hope that they pack everything correctly and don't fuck that up because they, they will fuck that up. There's, you know, it's so much easier to just go, there's six possible things and then send them each of the six things one by one by one by one to minimize the chance of them screwing it up and just say, okay, this is just the book, pack a thousand of these. This is the book and a bookmark, pack 500 of these. That's way easier than giving them a bunch of custom orders with add-ons. So like we'll probably, I don't want to say never, but it, it's likely we're never going to do add-ons on any Kickstarter because it, it creates such a crazy headache when it comes to the shipping process, because it gets too it'd custom. Be one, it'd be one thing if I was packing them all myself and I could go down the spreadsheet and make sure I did it. But we we can't pack all of these ourselves because we don't have anywhere to store all that stuff. Like there's no way me and Dave can do it. We have to hire a team to do it. And I don't trust a team of people that don't care to do that and get it right. And then that's going to cost tons of money and reshipping fees to get stuff fixed. So we just we just didn't offer it. Each tier adds a new thing. But basically, yeah. yeah. So pretty much like if we were to, just to give you an idea of how many books it is, if we were to put all of the books, let's just say in my living room, it would weigh as much as a car and my floor would collapse because I'm on the second floor and we'd kill everybody below. Yeah. So like totally by coincidence my parents have a factory where they manufacture epoxy so when the canada thing happened i was able to house a thousand books there temporarily but it's not like i could be like well mom and dad i've got five thousand books now uh we're gonna bring them in next like i can't do that there's not enough space even there i'm to going to commandeer that. this ship yeah this is my this is my warehouse now like that worked out the first time as, as it just, an emergency thing yeah, as an emergency thing, I was able to take that space and basically pay them a small amount of rent to use it. But man, it's just uh it's not we couldn't we couldn't pick and pack seven thousand things ourselves. Nope. But yeah. So yeah, we're sorry about that. Um I don't know if we really have a decision on if the poster and stuff are gonna be available on their own after. The reason for that is is that it creates so many more orders of just like, you know, cause if we, if we send the cards out, the cards are like, I think $10 on the Kickstarter to get the cards. We'd have to send the cards out with $5 shipping. Basically, if we offered them on their own, it would be a $15 total for domestic. It would probably be more international to send the cards out. And 
if the book isn't bundled in with them, we don't make enough off the sale of that deck of cards to justify sending out hundreds of orders of that deck of cards. And like, yes, it's not all about the money, but the time is what we have to put into book two and book three and book four. So if we're spending tons of time sending out stuff that we're not getting a good enough return on to merit losing that time, it's not something we can afford to do. By packing that stuff like the bookmarks and the cards in with the books, we can just have our team pack them together and ship them out and it's fine. And we're making the money from the book. So it's kind of like just a fun extra. But if we're selling that stuff on our own and shipping it ourselves, that's a huge amount of time we lose for not that much in return. Yeah. And we'd rather make things and have fun and like have stuff to actually show. Yeah. But anyway, that's the thing with business. That is the thing with it is you got to strike a balance with all of it because it's way too easy to forget why you're doing it in the first place. And yeah. Go after all of those things because theoretically there is a demand for it. Like people do want that stuff, but you know, while fulfilling that would make people happy. Ultimately we wouldn't be doing the thing that we set out to do, which is be able to fund our own books. Right. And then that's the thing we, want to do most of all at cons and stuff sure i'm sure we'll have stuff like that with us at cons but that's easy it's super easy but shipping out something like a bookmark that is small and weighs nothing and you're not going to make any money on because it's basically five dollars it's not worth shipping it because you're not making enough money to justify the time packing it and mailing it but yeah Uh, they want to see Cam Art wants to know if you have that brush in your Gumroad vids. Um, it's probably in one of them. Uh, I'm guessing it's in the line art one or something. Whichever one has all of my brushes because, yeah, the Bog Witch. Because uh, when I released that tutorial, people were like, but I want specifically the brushes you use in the video. I don't want all of them. So I kind of narrowed it down in the orc tutorial to only the brushes I was using in the video. So there was no confusion. Will you guys be using Kickstarter for all your future books, such as Starvale and Black Witch, or do you hope to fund them yourselves someday under acceptable comics? Uh, well, we're already funding them ourselves under acceptable comics. We're just doing it with a pre-order model using Kickstarter. Like, we could do pre-orders in a different way, but Kickstarters have the added benefit of, number one, feeling like an event, so people are excited to give money. And number two, Kickstarter can help you promote it if you get selected as a project they like, and you can go out of, like, you know, this is active right now, and more people see it than if you were just doing it yourselves. Yeah. Because basically... If we just promoted it on our own website and made a mailing list and said, okay, we're taking pre-orders now, nobody would see that other than our immediate audience. The benefit of being on Kickstarter is that way more people who didn't know your thing existed get to see it. And other creators that make similar things also see it because it shows up as a similar thing. Mm -hmm. So you end up hitting all these different things all at once. You start networking, you get a bigger audience, you sell more books. Um, yeah, it's basically free advertising if you can do it the right way. So we'll probably keep using Kickstarter for the foreseeable future. I don't think there's ever going to be a scenario because I'm trying to think like best case scenario, what would even happen? Like a publisher agrees to take all the risk and put something out, but then we wouldn't get much of a return. We'd have to give up a bunch of quality control to them to make the book cheaper. Uh, I don't think we're ever going to be okay doing that because we don't want to make like a really mediocre book just to have it go to more stores. Like, I'd rather have a super nice book that less people got. We funded on Kickstarter than have a very mediocre book that's sitting on a shelf in every Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Like, and the thing is like, just, uh, when people think about something, you know, and it's exclusive, like it is with us, it's more special. Like if you know, you could always get something, then you're less likely to get it, you know, like, because we're just us, it's you know you know you're supporting us directly you know that it's just two people doing this you know there's I, I, people are more likely to support something like that than if your book is in a barnes and noble mm-hmm. like you know even if we did sell a lot like dan was saying we would never see any of that like people who make books um on a small scale especially comic books they don't actually make a lot of money off of that 
It's not like yeah. the early Marvel, you know, 1990s when like everything was crazy and people were making millions. Like it just doesn't work. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like it's people want to feel like they're supporting you and we're totally cool with that because it allows us to make the book we want and have total control. Right. And uh, if that ever goes away, like if Kickstarter ever stops being a thing, then we may have to do that. But for now, yeah. do it as long as we can with ourselves. Uh, Jack Bong says, Daniel Warren, my wife is wondering when the Kickstarter money comes out of her bank account. Uh, all the cards will be charged, I believe, on November 1st. And then what's going to happen, because this happened last time, it's completely natural, a bunch of cards, probably about a thousand to 1500 are going to get flagged as errored because the bank will go, Oh, someone's trying to take money out of your account. Even though you pledged to it, the bank doesn't know that. And then what I'm going to have to do is send out a mass email to everybody saying, please fix your errored cards. And then I'm going to have to message people on a personal thing where I go sleuth them down and find them on Facebook and stuff. Cause my email through Kickstarter is probably going to go to spam, but keep an eye out. I believe it's either on October 31st when the Kickstarter, I think it ends at midnight. So it's going to be November 1st. All the cards are going to get charged um, all at once. And then we're going to, you know, a bunch of people's will go through a bunch of people's won't. And then me and Dave will start a process of tracking down everybody to make sure that their pledge is collected. Um, let's see. There was another the question. Illustration agencies. That's an older question. Oh, and I was going to answer the one about, um, is it only available on Kickstarter? What about Amazon? It's only available on Kickstarter. Yep. The book is not on Amazon, and we do not have any plans to put it on Amazon anytime soon. If ever. Are you guys going to be at any events like THU next year? I would cream if you would come. Uh, probably not if it's the same time it was this year, because we're probably going to be getting ready to launch our third book or at least working very hard on it so we can launch it later. Um, THU is a, that's Trojan horses, unicorn for people that are listening that don't know, um, is a really cool event, but unfortunately, cause we're in the United States, it's a very expensive event to get to. And it takes a lot of time in travel to, to go there and come back. So, I would love to go. Uh, a lot of our friends go, and I've heard nothing but great things about it. But because we're kind of locked into the every Halloween model right now, I don't know if we're going to have the time. Uh, if we do, that'd be great. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, we've kind of uh, overall just stopped. And, like, we're not invited to stuff anymore. Not because of any, like, negative thing. Just because we, just we haven't done anything yeah. illustration or video game related. <laughs> we stopped like self promoting ourselves as as illustration people for the past two years, so people just kind of stopped asking. Yeah, so now it's just hey, comics and yeah, yeah. None of those events are about comics really. <laughs> yeah. What do you think about working with illustration agencies if you don't work with any why? Um, it's basically like working with any agency like we're you know We have agencies that want to represent our comics now It's it's basically just a trade-off that you have to make for yourself. It's not that they're all bad or they're all good There are good agencies and bad agencies and there's reasons to use an agency and reasons to not use an agency The typical argument is that if you want higher profile clients and you want to spend less time kind of digging up uh, networking and like you know trying to meet the right people you can hire an agency that already has those connections in place and they'll do all that stuff for you so you can focus on your art. The trade-off is they take a cut of your money, anywhere from 10 to 35%, depending on the agency. So some people think that because money is time in freelance, it's worth the money to not spend all the time networking and chasing down potential clients, just let somebody else do it and make less money per piece. Other people think, well, I can do all that stuff on my own, so there's no point. A um, good example is, you know, sometimes you'll see artists in like National Geographic or Time and you're like, how did they get their work in here? I could do this. And almost every time it's because they're with an agency that has a connection to that publication. So you can get bigger clients. It's sort of like joining the film union in Hollywood. How did that guy ever get to work on Batman? How did that guy ever get to work on, you know, this thing? It's because they joined the union. It's, you know, they have a, they have to work on it. They joined a thing that has a connection to it. Let me so, just insert a correction there, right? right what Dan just said. How did that woman work in the industry? Oh, wow. 
trying to get the stream progressive, doing everything I can. How did that cisgender male get into that industry? Guess I've been outed. Dan's been outed. Sexist, homophobe. Fuck you, <sighs> pussy. I was thinking specifically of the person who designed Bane. I remember that when I saw that concept art, I was like, how? How did this person ever work on this? Yeah, I know what you mean. But yeah, it's like, that's the thing is, um, if you do want to use an agency, it's not that it's a bad idea or a good idea. It's just what kind of work do you want to do and what benefit can the agency give you? Because if you're doing mostly fantasy art, working for like D&D stuff, and you don't really have an interest in doing more highbrow illustration, an agency is not going to do much for you because there's not really any highbrow fantasy clients. If you're an illustrator that can do everything and you happen to do fantasy because it pays the bills, if you're someone like, um, oh, who am I? Tyler Jacobson. He's, he's a world-class illustrator who happens to do a lot of Dungeons & Dragons stuff because it pays the bills and he enjoys it. But he gets his work into stuff like National Geographic and Time and The New Yorker and other big publications and he does murals and he sells stuff to private collections because he's also an illustrator that can do very classical, very contemporary stuff. So it's really sort of like, number one, to be part of an agency, what benefit do they give you? Number two, are you an artist where an agency model would even work in the first place? And number three, do you need those connections or can you make them on your own? And it's different for everybody because some people in agency is not going to do anything for you. Other people, it's probably a really great idea. So, yeah. For what me and Dave do, uh, an agency doesn't really make sense. So I don't think either of us have ever used one. No, I, I've never wanted to do it just because I've never had uh, trouble just like talking to people, doing the networking thing and finding work that way. And uh, yeah, it just never came up of like, oh, that like it didn't make sense for me on some stuff. I mean, for some people, it can make sense if you're really, uh, you know, if you're a quiet person, reserved, you don't care about that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. then yeah. You can be like, yeah, of course. Like, I want to give somebody else this responsibility. Mm -hmm. And then the other cool thing is that, you know, you'll... The the cool thing is if, if you are a person where something like an agency works, I'm thinking of people I know who've used them before, you'll find yourself doing jobs you never in a million years even would have considered yourself doing that you might enjoy a lot that you probably never would have tried if it wasn't for getting recommended by the agency. But again, it's like the kinds of jobs that need agencies to find work for them are typically not stuff in like the fantasy sci-fi genre. Wait Very a, occasionally. Yeah. Wait a second. Danny Moore. He asks, I've been curious for a while. What are your guys thoughts on furries? Degenerate or fan? Are you speaking of my fursana, Dragonstar? Because I've been a major part of that community for centuries almost. I've been around a long time. Or at least Dragonstar has in some form or another. I can sum up our thoughts on it. Been You'll there, done that. A, been there, done that, yeah. Literally what I was going to say. Really? Yeah. Listen. I filled I filled plenty of dogs holes. I'll be the first That's guy to admit it. Not what I was going to say. I wouldn't fuck a dog. Would I fuck somebody in a dog suit? You're working backwards from this. Who knows the limits are When you say a dog's hole, do you mean a literal dog or just anything that looks like a dog like a person in a costume? I'll fuck anything that looks like a dog. Let's just put it that way. I won't fuck a dog, but if anything looks like a dog or woofs like a dog, I'll fuck it. I fucked a lot of things that look like animals. I'll fuck a chimp. I'll fuck my hand if I draw a dog's face on it. I'll do anything. I'm out. All right. I'm out. You're out. It's fine. You lost me. I'm out. It's fine. I was gonna. I was gonna share kitty cat combat and say been there, done that. Oh, uh, kitty cat combat was pretty good. Yeah, but you know, yours was good too. I mean, whatever. Was it as good? I don't know. Who knows? Here you go, guys. You want to know our thoughts on furries? I'll post this video in the chat. Not video. Image. I could post the video, though. <laughs> I won't post the Here's video. Here's a video of Dave fucking his hand. It's a dog hand. 
Yeah. Here you go. That's our thoughts on that's our thoughts on furries. Can uh, I pull this up. What is this? Go ahead. Oh. Uh, did you guys go through a really good printer to keep the cost down for a hardcover for your Kickstarter? That's we us. went through a great printer Years named ago. Mark Vieira on the mark dot net. Mark it on the mark dot net. You need printing. You need a beautiful book. You need some cards. You need something. Call Mark up. Call yeah. him up. Call Mark up because he won't mark up. There you go. Call Mark up to get a mark down. Oh, fuck. <laughs> fuck you. Found it. Ugh. You kept digging. I kept digging. Elu's getting concerned. She's trying to crawl into my lap. <laughs> Father, stop. It's okay. The comfort dog has been tur- has been activated. <laughs> Oh, God. So, anyway, those are thoughts on furries. Uh, let's see. Someone says, please draw a dragon star. Hmm, maybe. Do you really want me to draw a dragon star instead of this? No, maybe. Okay, okay. <laughs> Do you have any characters that are similar to the image character Spawn? Uh, absolutely, we do. His name's Jerry. He's in book one. Shit. Anyone else? You think of anyone else? I'm drawing Dragon Star. All right. Hmm. Hell yeah, dude. At Steve Lichman, how did you meet Kim in the first place? Met her in uh, Noman uh, Workshop forever ago. Ganaman. Yeah, Ganaman. And big, I didn't big talk Lenny? to her for like years. One year? Year and a half? Something like that. And then... um, <laughs> Sorry. I'm... This question in the chat. Wow. What is up with dog pussy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an insanely good question. What is up with it? Hey, who's Big Lenny? Uh, see, Kamart keeps mentioning Big Lenny. Oh, that's a running joke we have in the stream. Oh, I must have not been here for that. Yeah. Who's Big Lenny? Uh, I don't know. Is it not a running joke? I can't even remember, really. Uh... Hold on, I'm drawing Shadow Star. Hey guys, this is a long shot, but do you know anything about how companies such as Hot Topic or whatever get their licensed t-shirts? I'm asking because my stuff has gotten ripped off and I find it sold as official merch. I'm wondering if there is a way I can sell a design to them directly. Well, uh, there's basically two things you can do. Uh, Probably both include getting a lawyer. If you want to sell them direct to Hot Topic, you can have a lawyer contact Hot Topic and say that they're selling stolen merchandise. And then once you get a call back from Hot Topic, you can go, hey, I'm totally willing to sell you this thing directly. But that's probably not going to go anywhere because you don't have a T-shirt company and you're not going to be able to manufacture 20 million T-shirts to send to Hot Topics all around the country. Hot Topic doesn't make their T-shirts. They buy them from T-shirt companies and they stock them and sell them in the store. So that's probably not going to work. The more likely route is to have a lawyer contact the company who is stealing your stuff and say, I now want a royalty for every copy of the shirt you've ever made. If you've made 10,000 shirts, I want a royalty on each unit of those 10,000 shirts. Then you have to prove it was stolen. You have to go to court and have a judge rule in your favor. And then the most important part, which is also the hardest part, is you have to then collect on it. Even if you win a case, you're going to have a very hard time collecting because they can dodge the collection multiple times. But that's how you would go about it. You can't sell the design to Hot Topic because Hot Topic doesn't own the shirt. Hot Topic is simply selling a shirt somebody else owns and sold to them. It's not Hot Topic's brand, really. It's it's someone else housing their stuff and selling it at Hot Topic. You'd have to go after the, the shirt creator. You'd have to go after them, hunt them down, kill them. 
The thing you could do with the shirt creator too is say, alternatively, if you don't want to go to court and pay me a royalty, I can sell you the design. So then you can sell that shirt and then you'd have to arbitrate a price that's fair for both of you. Uh, let's see. Dan, did you already tell the story about the retarded kid getting baptized <laughs> in the horse trough? Number one, kind of. Number two, the kid did not get baptized in the horse trough. My uncle, who effectively kidnapped the kid, got baptized in the horse trough. But I like that version of the story that didn't happen better. I think I said it that way in the, <clears throat> in the tease. The point is, is that he convinced the kid that they were avenging angels. There you go. And that's just as good. Just as good. If it's your fan art, then it yeah, you're you don't own the character. So it, basically if you reached out to them saying you stole my fan art for the shirt, they would be entitled I see that's where it gets super complicated because then they'd say, "Okay, well, do you own this character?" and you'd say, "No, but I own the art." And they'd say, "Okay, well, we have to contact the company that owns the character." And then you're in a three-way situation where they owe you money and you owe the company money. So and you're in a three-way situation. <laughs> yeah. Where you're getting you're suing and then getting sued. So you're like it's not worth it at that point. That's like Dave could have gone after the company that stole his Skeletor to do a Masters of the Universe cover technically, but there's no point in doing it because then Hasbro, I think who owns it would just go well, what the fuck? That's not your royalty money. Like, but do you mean the whole deal with that stuff is that, yeah, like you can technically go after those people to some extent. Mm -hmm. Like they should buy the image from you to license it because that happens all the time. Like I've done that before, like the mountain, the t-shirt company that does all those wolf shirts, you know, they've reached out to me and gone like, oh, we have a deal with Marvel. Can I get that Venom picture from you? And, you know, we'll pay you this much for it. That happens. So when people tell you that, like, oh, you're illegal for even making that thing, it's like, no, you're not. No. You can license all kinds of shit. It's like, you know, just because something's on paper and then you can, you know, then you're technically getting paid to make it, that's, that's something too, but it's not wrong for you to make it ahead of time and then sell it to the people. It's the same thing that I've said before, where if you apply for a job at a video game company with stuff from that company's video games, they can't then go and use that work in their games. That's illegal. No. Yeah. It, it's weird because how do you fight that? But it's mm -hmm. still them in the wrong. It's just a complicated legal process. So yeah. there's two. It's really see, not worth it. You're still technically in the right. Uh, truly epic because the thing is is that they should have licensed your art from you to sell the shirt yes they're in the wrong because they didn't license it from you they can't turn around and say well you should have licensed the character from the company to do the fan art because you didn't sell the fan art so you're technically blameless you just made fan art somebody stole the difficult part comes in where you can't sell fan art technically legally Unless you're at like, well, I mean, even at a con, if you do it, it's not legal per se. It just is so, somehow. <laughs> it just is. People just don't care about cons because it's all under the table and, you know, whatever. So then if you if you go after them, they're going to say, okay, well, did you, do you, did you have permission to sell this character? Because the second you take money from them to allow them to keep printing the shirt or back pay on shirts they've already made, if they stop, you are selling your drawing of that character. That's what that's going to be legally considered is you selling it. So then you're going to owe all or some of that money to the people that actually own the character if they ever find out. Because at that point, you're essentially selling fan art for branding purposes. And that gets you in a lot of trouble. Yeah, fan art pretty much like with me sits in that same space as whenever anybody uploads a song to YouTube. What you can do is make the company stop selling the shirt. You can absolutely do that. You can make them stop. Whether or not you collect any money off it, probably not. But you can absolutely make them stop. One of the things I hate, like, more than anything is, like, I don't care if people steal stuff personally. It's like, if you're going to steal stuff, like, that's a shitty thing to do, but 
whatever but like you know digital stuff or whatever if they're doing fan art and selling it at a convention uh but call it what it is like just be like yeah i'm stealing right now (laughs) Mm -hmm. it's when people try and make the argument for the other way like it's not stealing like i get that there is some kind of weird moral thing about getting popular off of fan art like uh you know what i did with a lot of my stuff Mm -hmm. like i understand that you know there's there's merit in just getting popular off your own thing and that's where i think it's weird about like doing fan art for other people and then having something like this happen like it reminds me of in a smaller way like when you go on when you go on youtube and you watch like one of your favorite musicians things like if i go on and i see that laser hawk has his whole entire album somebody uploaded the whole thing to youtube Mm -hmm. he doesn't see anything from that and they might have ad revenue on the video so they're technically making money on the video yeah and that's illegal but there's like a weird like right now we're still in that like internet wild west thing everybody talks about and it's just another one of those where it's like, yeah, like it's like everybody just kind of accepts it. And then they're just like, yeah, this is what it is. You know, this this exists. So I should be able to do it. And it's like, right. mm, not technically, but what are you going to do? Are you going to stop all of these people? It's too late. Like, and it's such right. a weird thing to do that it's hard to figure out like where it is on the I don't know, spectrum of legality. Like what what is so illegal about this? Like what are you technically stealing? Is it stealing? Does it help promote the thing? Like mm. like is it a fan thing? Like does do you want to have that negative backlash cuz all these people suddenly find out about Laserhawk from this thing? You know, it's like when everybody does like it's always this weird thing of like when it's at a certain level, like right now I'm drawing Shovel Knight. Yeah. Like Shovel Knight was born of that like indie mentality the kickstarter crowdfunding thing so it has like a different set of morals than something like you know samus because they yeah they people that get on kickstarter and get their stuff created under by nature of kickstarter understand that the crowd is the reason it's popular yeah so they're more likely to embrace stuff like fan art and things like that. But yeah, so it's a weird thing where it's like sometimes you're okay doing those things. Sometimes you're okay selling things. Like sometimes you can sell like Nintendo doesn't really care too much about fan art being sold. Um Yakora asked an interesting question which I guess this might be worth your time to pursue it, but I don't think it's going to end up leading to anything probably. Um, says, would it be possible for them to at least get your name attached to the product so that both parties benefit? That's Probably interesting not. because if a t-shirt company is selling a t-shirt with a character on it, they clearly have the license from the company already. So in that scenario, they'd basically be saying, well, we're legally allowed to sell this character because we have a deal with that company. At that point, they'd basically be subcontracting you as an artist that works for them to sell the character they've already bought the license to sell. So you could do that if you convince them to give you some money because they probably already bought the license and have the right to sell the shirt. So maybe you could get some money if you went at it from that angle where you're like, well, okay, consider me an employee. Give me a royalty check for all the stuff you did or I'm going to sue you. Like you might be able to get some traction there. Again, probably not because they're going to assume you don't have the money to sue them because it's going to cost a minimum of $10,000 to sue them. So most companies, like what happened to me last year, just run out the clock and they go, okay, yeah, you're going to sue us. Great. Good luck finding all the money to sue us. You know, we'll, we'll go to court till you don't have any money left. Um, that's probably what they're going to do, but it's still worth reaching out. I had another company in England that stole a design I did for a bunch of t-shirts, send me royalties for all the shirts they sold. It wasn't a huge number of shirts. It was only a hundred, but it was still nice to get a paycheck. And then they stopped selling the shirt. You know, sometimes it does work out yeah Um, it's a lot like in tv shows when you steal money from a drug dealer and you can spend it on whatever you want (laughs) it's like the person you're taking the artwork from technically isn't in the right either (laughs) so it's like oh well like you're just gonna have to hire somebody to come and kill me (laughs) uh c kamart says what do you think about sakimi chan she makes 60k a month selling porn fan art did you okay so We've talked at length about Sakimi Chan on here before. Uh, I think saying that she makes 60K a month uh, selling porn fan art is probably 
not a fair way to look at it. Yeah, she takes the clothes off of some of the characters for people at a certain pledge amount or something, and she sells prints of them at cons sometimes, but the overwhelming amount of her stuff isn't the softcore porn stuff. Like, she didn't build her empire painting naked characters. She built it doing, you know, the other stuff she does. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't reduce her to that, number one. Number two, what we think about her, we've talked a lot about on here before, where it's brilliant. She's a perfect storm of things for that audience. Everything about her as a person and an artist is perfectly geared to sell millions of dollars of prints to DeviantArt. She is the perfect storm. I also think whenever someone at Disney catches wind of what she's doing, she's going to get sued into oblivion. I don't think her model is going to last, and I think it's very risky what she's doing. I don't know how she hasn't been cease and desisted to all hell yet, but I'm sure it's coming. The way she gets around it, I think, as far as I can tell, is that she's saying she's selling the education by teaching people how to paint using fan art as a medium to teach them. She's not selling the art itself necessarily, but then she goes to cons and things and sells the art itself. So... I think once companies find out that, like, you know, if Disney finds out, oh, this person's making almost a million dollars a year selling fan art of Elsa with no clothes on, yeah, shut that down. I think that will happen at some point. I don't think it's sustainable. But she's making hay while the sun shines. You know, it's like she's just doing everything she can in the in the interim, and I can't really fault her for that. Um, but, yeah, I do think, you know... <laughs> I do think there's a reckoning coming somewhere down the line if she keeps growing at the rate she's growing. Oh, I mean, we used to do bad stuff when we were younger, and it's like yeah. it feels good while you're getting away with it, mm -hmm. but something's going to happen. There is a storm. <laughs> like You're going to hit a wall, and things are going to come down. It's like yeah. it's just a matter of time. That's how all that shit works. We've done streams before where almost the entire stream was talking about her, so I don't want to get too in the weeds on it. But basically, what she's doing with the Patreon is brilliant, but no one else can replicate it because everything she is is essential to that Patreon. Uh, you, you can't – that's the thing when I say it's like a perfect storm. You know, She's a girl painting anime girls to an anime girl audience, and she's Asian. Boom, 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 boom. Like it's it's straight down the line. People like the narrative of who she is. They like where she comes from. They like what she does. Just get um, I know. I'm sure a bunch of people are mad about that, but it's the truth. <laughs> Just it's kidding. the truth. It's the truth. You can't you can't look at that audience on DeviantArt that loves anime stuff and not see the fact that they're more excited to support an Asian female artist painting Asian female art. Like that's part of it. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm saying she's she's very smart for exploiting that. And for doing the volume of work that she does, because, oh, my God, does she put out lots of stuff. But at the same time, when she was just on Patreon, I thought it was hilarious and it was great and more power to her. We used to talk about how brilliant it was all the time. When she moved into cons and started shutting people out of artists' alleys, that's when I was like, oh, OK, you're now the enemy. Because... You know, at New York Comic Con, and again, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it because I could talk about this all night. Uh, she got three tables, which is unheard of. She got three tables, which is effectively half of an aisle. And the reason she got three tables, from what I'm told, I'm not sure if this is true, but from what all the other artists said was allegedly, she did, allegedly did collaborations with multiple quotations around that with other artists and then booked the other two tables in their names. So, oh no, this is this artist table. And oh no, this is this artist table and I'm in the middle. But then what happened was she pushed all three tables together, got a huge backdrop that went three tables long behind it and just basically shut out the entire, entire alley she was in. I was in the booth next to Sakimi Chan, directly next to it with my friend Nusha Gisemi. And let me tell you what that did to the business of everybody else in that aisle. The line for Sakimi Chan's thing, because it was so huge and because she had so much table space you could buy stuff at, because that's the thing people don't consider. The more table space you have, the more people you can line up behind the table to sell stuff to. It's like registers at the supermarket. Most tables are one register. There's a person behind a table, maybe two. With three tables, you can have 10 people. 10 people lined up selling stuff in 10 different lines. And that's basically what she did. And the line as a result for her thing, because number one, she was trafficking so much volume 
because she had the three tables and so much stuff was hanging up behind it. And she's super um, popular. And she's super popular. That what she could do as the con went on was prints are thirty dollars on day one. They're twenty dollars on day two. Oh, it's Sunday. We got to get rid of this inventory. You can get three for fifteen. And she did all that stuff, which again is great business. I'm not faulting her for that. But the unintended result is every other person in that aisle did no business that day because the line for her table blocked their table front. You couldn't see Nusha's table because the line for Sakimi Chan extended in front of it. You couldn't see Art Germ at the end of the aisle because Sakimi Chan's thing wrapped around the end. It's it's crazy. Like that's when I go, oh, okay you're becoming something that's shutting down other people's ability to sell an artist alley. And now it's a problem. Everything else I'm fine with, but that's when it becomes a problem. And then me, I'm like, still go for it. I want to see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm of the opinion that ride it until the wheels come off. Sakimi, let's see what happens. I want to see what happens. I want to see when you take that and you exploit it for everything. What happens yeah. to you? Something has to happen. And again, she's not she's not a bad person. She's not a scumbag or anything. She's not doing anything wrong, really, other than the artist alley thing. I she's do just think that's exploiting stuff. Yeah, she, she she's seeing the success and can doubling down on the success, which I can't fault her for. It's good business. But from a moral standpoint, the artist alley thing is kind of fucked. Everything else, totally fine with. The con yep. didn't do anything about it. You got my support, Sakimi. Keep on going. The con did nothing about it. I heard multiple people reported her, and they still didn't do anything about it. So they were like, well, but then that's the woman. other thing. They kicked other artists out of Artists Alley last year because they were selling wall scrolls, and they consider that a product in quotations, not artwork. So if you're selling a product and not art, you can't be an Artist Alley. But you can book three tables and push them together and shut everybody out if you're selling just prints, like. So who the fuck knows? That's the thing. It's like, who knows who she knows that's working there? Who knows? Like, it's it's such a weird political mess now to be part of Artist Alley at the bigger cons because so many people get rejected and they want to know why. Like, it, it's becoming critical mass at all the cons. Like, New York Comic Con, I think, is, what, officially bigger than San Diego now? Uh, it's getting close. In terms of attendance, not in terms of like the money they throw at it, but in terms of people that go there. Like if you have the Javits Center in New York and your con is too big for the Javits Center, something is you've got to stop. Like there's nowhere else in the city you could go to have that. That's the biggest possible place. But yeah, they could probably go to the wharf. This guy is sexually harassing me. Oh. Is there a lot of sexual harassment going on in the chat? I don't know. Let me just say this to you. Stop. <laughs> it's not about the quality of the art, Seekamart. That's the thing you're misunderstanding. People don't go to Artist Alley like it's a gallery in the 1700s, and they go, I am going to only support the, the finest until, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's not a salon in France. It's Artist Alley. Triggered again. Most, yeah, again, so much triggering. It's not about the quality of the art. I mean, sometimes it is, but most of the time people want to go there, number one, to meet people they follow online and buy some art in person. And number two, a lot of people just go there and walk around and see what catches their eye. And if you're working as an artist, which I'm guessing you are because you were asking questions about brushes and stuff earlier, your opinion of what is good art comes from a technical standpoint because you're a craftsman who works in the field and understands the craft point of view of it. Everyone who goes to Comic-Con, I'm going to say probably 99% of attendees don't do art for a living. They don't have the same understanding or appreciation of certain things that you do, and they look at art from a totally removed standpoint, and they see it differently. Something you would consider technically not as good, they're not going to see any of that stuff. They're either going to like it or they're not going to like it, and the reasons why are stuff that we can't possibly understand. So you can't say that someone who's technically better in your opinion deserves to sell more because the other person isn't technically as good. That's not how sales work, especially at Comic-Con. It's, you know, normal people will buy things for any number of reasons. Hence, Dragonstar. Yes. Hello? What's going on? Uh, let me see that right there. 
Um, how many Drinking hours coffee. a day do you spend on your art? All day. Yeah, I, I mean, used to spend all day. All all day I'm drawn. I mean, I don't spend time on it like, you know, not like in a in like a learning sense, but I definitely draw all day. I used to draw all day till I found my calling, uh, shipping books to Canada. Yeah. Now I do that all day. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I don't think I've drawn anything for myself since May. Yeah, right. pretty much. Pretty much since the Amazon thing happened, I I've pretty much only been doing client work and sending books out. Yep, the only um, the only fun was the writing. Yeah, not complaining though. I mean, it's still been. I found a way to make all the shipping stuff fun. I'm still learning how to run that side of a business, and it's been it's been beneficial. I do kind of miss art, though. <laughs> I'd like to get back into it. I'd like to get back into doing some art this winter if I possibly could. Uh, let's see. Has anyone wrote any Steve Lichman slash fiction? I don't know. Maybe um, we've seen him show up in like Reddit games, though, which is pretty cool. Yeah, we've seen some stuff. I saw what's the best way to handle a cringy moment. Laugh at it, remember it, use it, turn it into a comic. I turn into it so hard. Yeah, embrace it. That's my Double favorite thing it. to do is if somebody's going to bring me there, we're going to live there for a little while. That's how I do it. I will turn into that storm. Like, I do not care. It's like if you're going to make me do that kind of stuff, like awkward just a small example um uh, my uh i get to say this now my wife <laughs> her family it, there's uh it is weird hearing that yeah so her uncle i my what what that was that my uncle in law <laughs> what do you even call I get, that i don't know i, I guess never just, knew what yeah. to call that but anyway so he's super awkward and every time he tries to like shake my hand he makes it i don't know how he does this but he makes it the most awkward thing in the whole universe the it's, one who was in aspen with us yeah oh, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah so yeah. it's it's always oh no he wasn't in aspen um where did i meet him i know i met him somewhere i know who but you're talking I... about but no yeah so he's uh it's always a handshake and then it, and then I always turn it into a hug and then he always still tries to go for the handshake so he's holding my hand <laughs> while hugging and then he'll like move his hand away and his hand will still be floating in the I'm about to shake your hand pose the and then I'll threat. just hold him and I go that's right <laughs> <laughs> that's right I just do everything in my power to ruin those moments Lime, Lime Samurai, Samurai! Four once in a while Thank you so much, you beautiful you. lime samurai. Can you do the God. voice? And from the audiobook? Yeah. Uh can you do can you do a proper Steve Lichman, book two, Asakushina Monsutobin? Okay. That one? <laughs> I, that? I was gonna say, yeah, can one? you do a proper thank you to a samurai? Oh, okay. Oh god. Let me he trigger some more people. Subscribed. Here. I can't talk about Sakimi Chan that way and then do racist Asian accents. Yeah, you accents. can do it. Oh, okay, I can you're do talking it. to Let's a samurai. Uh, I'm not gonna do it. What am I talking about? I was gonna say most honorable I'm samurai. I can't do that. Yeah, you can. I can't do that. He just gave ooh, us money, Jesus. Dan. I just, ooh, God. He just gave us money. That. I don't know if I can do that. Are you gonna make me do a not as good one? Actually, now that you've offered, absolutely. Uh, thank you, it's a Mitch. <laughs> And what was that? Worth every penny. What Worth was? Worth every penny. What was that? That wasn't even a good uh, one. You had to do the. Uh, you want to do one of those? I'm triggered. That's straight out of Last Samurai. Good. Uh, okay. And Waldinger. 
let Lin J- I'm so sorry. Now that we're on the topic of controversial artists, what do you guys think of Feng Zhu and his situation with Eduardo Pena? I don't know who Eduardo Pena is, and I don't care about Feng Zhu. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Feng Zhu is a guy does really kind of, uh, I don't know, what would you call industrial concept art, like film stuff, uh, has a school. Uh, I don't know anything about him. I know nothing about him. Uh, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what you're referencing. Sorry. I don't know. Whoever did the wrong thing is a terrible person. There you go. Still can't believe you less... made me do that. Well, you know. What's the part in Last Samurai when he goes, good? Oh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? I know what, exactly what's what you're the... talking about. What scene is that? Is it when he, like draws the thing on the ground or was it is it when he finally answers this question about the war or something i can like see it in my head is it when he's just... talking about general custard no yo american red indian that scene mm. good <laughs> i just want to know what the good scene is the good i give it <clears throat> i gotta watch it now I gotta watch the scene now. I gotta watch the whole movie just to find that one fucking part. Mm. Dan does the Emperor voice from uh, the end the of The Last Samurai. It's true. I do it in the audiobook. Yeah, he does it in the audiobook. Are you what are with him? Oh, when he died? <laughs> so, so sorry, but that you may not. doesn't sound like him. <laughs> Oh God, that was way off. That's what it is in the audiobook. No, audiobook's closer than that. Uh, <laughs> maybe it was your proximity to the mic. No, maybe. Maybe it's because I was way too close to the mic. I don't know. Oh. That's what he did. He goes, You were with him uh, when he died? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Like a little little boy man. Little man boy. Little man boy emperor. Yeah. Oh, guys, you know, if you're into topical light, humor, light into racism. racism, light racism, you know, playful racism, like, uh, placism, it's it's like salad dressing. You don't want too much. You want a little, little bit of light, a little bit of light on there. Give it a little bit of flavor. I like yeah. just a little bit of racism in my life. Speaking of which, Asian, hold on. Dressing. Asian people have it coming. They're the most racist people I've ever met. That is actually... Very true. Very uh, racist people. Yeah. Where like what was the thing Kim was telling us about where like who's not allowed in Vietnamese stores and then Koreans don't allow other people in their stores? No, it's and, like, the hierarchy this... of hatred. Yeah, there's a whole structure to it. Yeah, there's like jungle Asians and everything else. Yeah, that, uh, there's yeah. all kinds of uh stuff I've learned about. Well, I've said the story in here before of when I went to of when I went to the Asian store to buy a rice maker and I go to, it's a Korean market. I go there and I'm looking for a rice maker. I go inside and I say, you know, actually I'm taking pictures of rice makers and I'm sending them to Kim and I'm like, you know, which one do you want? Cause this is when we first moved in together. We were like, yeah, let's buy, let's buy a, uh, you know, rice maker. So I go there, I'm taking pictures. The lady comes up, she, she says, you know, take pictures of these. And I was like, well, I'm trying to get my you know, girlfriend at the time. I'm just trying to figure out which one she wants. And she goes, your girlfriend Asian? And I go, yeah, she's Asian. And she goes, uh, she Korean? And I said, no, nah, she's Vietnamese. And she goes, Vietnamese no buy these. Vietnamese wow. buy these. And then she shows me the cheaper ones. <laughs> So I laugh. I'm laughing really hard because she's like super racist and I thought it was hilarious. So I'm yeah. sitting there laughing and then I go, all right, cool. So I go over to the cheaper ones and I take a picture and I send them to Kim and I go, I go, hey, she, she thinks that uh, you're poor so because you're Vietnamese and you don't deserve good rice makers. And I said, so are these the ones you want? And she goes, actually, yeah, those are the ones I want. <laughs> <laughs> so she wasn't wrong. Validation. She wasn't wrong validation but i love that yeah they're they're real racist 
I've, I mean, that's not like the first thing I've ever experienced. Speaking of which, someone mentioned in the chat, but I was going to bring it up anyway. Uh-huh. Did you watch that new H3 H3 with the Joey salads? Yeah, I saw that. The fact that anyone thinks that's real blows my goddamn mind. Oh, people are fucking dumb. People are so stupid. The fact that anyone thought anything in that video was real is so crazy to me. I don't get how anybody believes any of this shit. Like, there's so many videos on Facebook right now where you can see, like, it's always two couples that prank each other, and they Mm -hmm. always have the same exact response. Oh, no. Oh, what? A camera? (laughs) It's like, are you fucking joking with me? Like, how do people believe that this is real? Like, it's yep. so insane to me, and they they always have, like, 10 billion likes, and, like, there's that one video of that black dude thinks, pulling the gun oh. on the cop, and it's like, yeah, it's not real. It's not real. Like, it's not... How it's do you crazy. believe it? I don't get it. I do not get it. Like, bad acting. It's, uh, like, why is there a camera there? That video where she thinks her friend's cheating on her, or like her boyfriend's cheating on her with her friend, and they they run out of the house, and then he proposes to her. Yeah. That one, and the whole time they're running, babe, wait, babe, (laughs) babe, wait. All it makes me want to do is make is make them like I just want to make videos like that. Yeah, just rake in that YouTube cash. Like that's all I ever think when I see him. I'm like, is this really all it takes? Hi, I'm an idiot. And I'm about to do a social experiment. It's always like the meathead dudes. Yeah. Who can't we're taking, act. We're taking Stacy over to her friend's house because her boyfriend hasn't been calling her the past few days. What she doesn't know is that he's got quite a surprise in store for her. <laughs> like, you can't talk. Like, they have what dead she doesn't eyes. know is that we've got cameras filming the whole thing from a safe distance. Like, uh Let's all see what people think. I'm going to go to an all-black neighborhood and hold an All Lives Matter sign. And let's see what people think about that. Like, get out of here. Like, it's so fucking fake. It's, uh... <sighs> Anyways, people love believing stuff. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Yes. Yes. Anyways, I don't, to get back on whatever that question was, I ha- honestly, I wasn't trying to be rude or joke about it. I have no clue uh, what you were talking about with the Feng Zhu thing because neither of us really follow any of those people. I know who Feng Zhu is from a fringe thing. I know people that like know him or have taken a class or have worked for him. I don't know anything about Feng Zhu as a person. I, I honestly don't really know what his art looks like. I know it's like industrial kind of movie landscape stuff when i say industrial i mean like stuff that would come out of like hollywood industry stuff like i don't really know anything about him though and i don't know who eduardo is but yeah oh let's see you guys were talking about what you should do to make your art projects relatable to other people than just artists do you have any tips thoughts on that Uh, basically, yeah, think about every, I mean, it's an obvious answer, but think about everything in the project besides the art for more than you probably are. Like, you know, it's, it's like, I'll use our book as an example. People don't fund it because the art's amazing and it's the best art they've ever seen. They fund it because of the story and the characters and the other things that are on the outside of it. Like art's a good way to get people in. If you can like, you know, people can see an image and understand what the project is. You might get people in, but the thing is, is that you, you got to play to more than just that. You got to have something substantial for when they get there. It's like when you see those really flashy advertisements on websites for those digital card games, like play this epic thing. And it's like the cool image. A lot of people might click that because they think the image is cool. But if they get to the site and there's nothing of substance there, or it's very clearly just kind of hollow and just art and not really anything to back it up, they're not going to hang around. They're going to go, oh, okay, and move on to the next thing. Yeah, it's the same thing as like a Michael Bay movie. Right. If you're doing art just for art, then you can probably sell that to other artists that appreciate just art. The problem is is that, like we've talked about before, it's a ever-reducing box. You've got, okay, this is marketable to just artists and people that like art. And then you go, how many of them like the particular genre I'm doing? Let's say you're doing sci-fi. Instantly, 
70 percent of that audience is gone you're only playing to sci-fi people because that's what you do then it's what kind of sci-fi do they like do they like the kind i'm doing and then that box gets smaller and now it's 50 percent of that 75 percent and then it's how many of them actually have the money to buy it and then you reduce it even more and then it's how many of them can i reach with this because a lot of them probably won't even know i'm doing the book and then it gets even smaller so that's the thing is like you want to no matter what project you're doing, those collapsing brackets are going to happen with anything as you move into launching it and making it real. So you want to start with something that's a little more expansive than just this is the genre of art I do and that's it. You want to try and have something else there so you can get more people on board because the result is it shouldn't just be about the money, obviously, but you need enough money to make it viable to take the time off to do it because it's a living that's, you know, it just has to be that way. So you have to find a way to approach it where you're going to make enough to sustain yourself. But yeah. And it's about time to get back to the plugin. So right now our second Kickstarter is live. We have two books available, Steve Lichman Volume 1, Second Edition, and Steve Lichman Volume 2, First Edition, which is signed and numbered, hardcover, cloth book with gold foil stamped. And uh, it's, it's really good, thick paper. They're $30 for the volume two. And for the pack together, they're 50, right? 50, is it 50? Let me look. Sorry, we did the campaign and my brain shut off. Let me see how much it is together. Yeah, $50 for the advanced warrior tier where you get both of the books together. And yeah, that's going on till October 31st. On the Kickstarter is the only way to get the books. We'll have a small store online for two weeks after the Kickstarter ends where you'll be able to buy multiple copies for friends and family. We're almost at 200000 for our mm-hmm. campaign. We appreciate everybody's support. And if you'd like to read the book before you buy it, we have two previews available for book one and book two below the video on the Kickstarter link. You can go to stevelichman.com, L-I-C-H-M-A-N, and you can check it out there and make your decision if you'd like a copy because it's the only place you can get it. So don't miss out if you want one. And uh, yep. yeah, love to you. Love to you. On the on the project thing, I guess the last point I'll make, try to find something that's consistent you can do because one thing that I know that bums a lot of people out, bums me out, is when you see promo art for a thing and you support it thinking it's going to be what the promo is and then you get it and it's totally different and you're like, Mm. what the hell? Like, I'm not throwing this guy under the bus. I love his work and I get why he couldn't do it. I just wish it was more apparent. Like, Alex Alice did this series of Siegfried graphic novels Mm. and he he promoted it with this, like, amazing Disney-style animated video with the, you know, Wagner operas under it. And did these really awesome promo images. And I was like, whoa, the comic's going to look like this. Like, I didn't expect it to look like the totally finished paintings. But I thought it would at least look like the Disney style video he put out. I was like, this is going to be awesome. And then I got the book and it looks nothing like any of it. And I was like, oh, all right. Well, it's a good, I mean, the story's good. He did a good job. But like this, I feel like there's a hole now because I was expecting this thing that's never going to exist. Yeah, it's actually one of the reasons why we scaled back on our original idea to promote Steve is we were going to do, like, I've been doing a bunch of animation stuff, so I was like, let's just do, like, an animated thing. And it was like, yeah. wait a second, if we do an animated thing and it looks really cool, all people will think about is, oh, that should be an animated thing. Yeah, they're going to go, oh, you know, the comic's funny, but I really wish it was animated because yeah. that's what you sold it as. Yeah, so it's like you got to sell it as exactly what it is. Yeah. How are we sending out the audiobook codes? Uh, they're coming maybe tomorrow, actually. Um, yeah, they're going to be sent out in an email. Uh, basically, you're going to get a, two messages, I think is the safest way to do it. You're going to get a message from Kickstarter where I message all the backers and say, here's your code. And then you're going to get an email from us on the acceptable email because we're going to export everybody from that tier because you're more likely to get that one. And I'll say, you know, check your email for a Kickstarter message from us. Your code is inside. So that's that's what's going to happen. It's going to be two emails because most people do not get their Kickstarter emails. Yep, it'll be an email from Steve Lichman at acceptablecomics.com. Can we talk a bit about competitive tickling 
all I will can. say all I will say on that topic is go watch Tickled. It's great. It's great. And if you can't watch Tickled or can't afford it or can't find it, go listen to the episode of The Dollop from, I think, the first 20 episodes of The Dollop Podcast. It's free. They cover the competitive tickling crime ring, and it's the greatest, greatest thing. Greatest thing. It's basically there's a there's a ring of people that created a con- competitive tickling league, and to get away with it because they were ashamed that it's their fetish, they started saying that they were with the military, and they were researching tickle torture to give it some kind of validity. And then when people threatened to expose them, they were like these creepy old men that have this weird fetish. When people threatened to expose them, they started releasing photos they had taken that people didn't know about of them, like, you know, naked getting tickled and like threatening to ruin their lives and blackmailing them and like, you better shut up. Like, we're, you know, like, you don't know what you're fucking with. This is bigger than you, like all kinds of terrible, horrible things. But uh, yeah, all because two old men had a fetish. For young men with their shirts off getting tickled. Do we want to tease anything for people who are here? Tease uh, any of the audiobook or anything like that? I mean, you're the one broadcasting. I don't know how you'd play it, but you could if you want to. Yeah, I'm just saying. Sure. You interested in that? Yeah, I mean, that's up to the chat. Do you guys want to hear some of the audiobook? I just want to show you guys something because, you know, you support us directly like the people in the Kickstarter and we want to, yeah, you know, bring you in on things while we're doing Let's it. Sh- you interested in what? hanging out with us? At least we can do is show you some stuff we've been doing. Sure. All right. What's your opinion on V for Vendetta, the most popular graphic novel on it? Really? It's the most popular graphic novel on Amazon? Well, I didn't know I that. Guess, I guess I, mean, I thought it would be Watchmen. I guess that makes sense, though. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's a good book. I like the movie a lot. One of the only adaptations where I'm like, oh, the movie holds up. All right. So what I'm going to do is play it. And I'm also going to show you the comic that it's related to. What issue are you doing? Um, I was thinking about doing the, you know, one we were going to do with Wheeler. Just the the early Wheeler. Because we were going to put that up anyway uh sure is that one in the okay yeah yeah go ahead 14 yep i believe it's oh it's not up on the actual thing i have it is it in yeah i mean you can play it if you have one you might not have the final one but i don't if dave plays it and there's a couple little errors it's because he has a version from like four months ago but um yeah go ahead all right so just yeah just keep talking i'm gonna look for it dave's looking it up he's looking it up I can send you, well, whatever. We'll I'm on the Dropbox. Can you upload 14? Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, just the same folder, and I'll just refresh it and then download it. A lot of stuff got deleted on the Dropbox as we started finishing stuff to make space. Um, Let's see. What is the folder called? Audiobook Final? Yeah, it was the one with the apes in it. Yeah. Infernal okay. Dawn asks, is this spooky Shovel Knight? Yeah, this is the Steve Lichman Shovel Knight collabo. Collabo. Doing, uh, you know, video game stuff for Steve Lichman because it's Halloween's coming up on the 31st. That's when That's when uh, we're going to be ending our Kickstarter. So usually, I mean, well, it's only the second year, but uh, during the month, October while the campaign's going on I like to do some Halloween stuff of Steve dressing up in other costumes and this is one of them Mm -hmm. I don't know is there a better one to play I guess it doesn't matter I just think it'd be nice to play something and we can just sit back and scroll through and hopefully people enjoy it I'm just wondering if that's the funniest one to lead with but whatever whatever I don't want to spoil anything for you guys we can do Chomp if you want. <laughs> oh, I don't care. Because Chomp's in there. Whatever we got to do. Mm. Let's see. Let's 
Oh, yeah, that is the funny part of the tickle thing is the two old guys that have a fetish for young men getting tickled shirtless are also homophobic. <laughs> they like they hate themselves. They're so ashamed of their fetish that they project it onto everybody else. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's my favorite kind of shame. It's when people cannot admit what they are and everyone else knows. And they just get so mad. John Silva says, I don't want the funniest, but I do want a funny one. All right. Let's do it up. Do you want me to play Chomp? No, go ahead. Do whatever you want. All right. So this one's Chomp. I got it up on the screen here. I'll zoom in a little bit so we can scroll through the comic together. And uh, we'll see where it goes. So this is a little bit of the audiobook. Make sure the levels are good. Chapter 15. Sure. Break up. I can't hear it, so. Steve and his friends were on their way over to Flay's room to hang out one summer afternoon and talking about their good friend, Ben. I hear you, Flay, but what can you do? All I'm saying is he smokes that shit yeah, way too much. Once in a while, fine, whatever. But come on, every day? Well, it's not like we can make him stop. It's his life, Flay. It was then, as if blindsided by a runaway bus, that Brendan opened his mouth. Store. Unwarranted political opinions regarding... It played the wrong one. I don't know why. Technical difficulties, everybody. Technical difficulties. It played the wrong one. I'll get it. I'll get it set up. Bear with us. We're new to the radio scene. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say I uh, I unmuted it and it was the one with uh, the mummy. Yeah, it said it was fifteen, but it it wasn't. Oh, did I misnumber it in the Dropbox? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll go back and Chapter check. Chapter fourteen. Don Wheeler. Here we go. By, a, by immersion. Sinking deep okay, into the funny. plentiful plush okay. of their bean bags, Ben and Mandusa sat in an ever thickening mist of the stickiest, ickiest skunkweed. It wasn't clear how long it had been since they sparked up their first hit of that donk dicky dow ditch weed, but the two were seemingly far into what was a very deep, very cool, semi cosmic conversation, man. It was a dungeon full of gungeon, and the ganja was flowing free. They were kneeling low at the throne of King Bud, and after a long, contemplative silence, Ben began to speak. So, space is like... everything. But also, space is nothing, you know? Floating through a sea of sativa, Ben began to traverse the dreamscape pocketing fallen wisdom from the fruitful trees of insight. Mandusa sat, silent, listening, zoning hard yet chilled the fuck out, eyes slowly closing like half-eclipsed binary suns. Dimba do, dimba ding, Donna wanna, ain't no thing. Space is what's in it? So, if we're in space? Then space is us, which means we are space. You know what? This is getting a little too deep for me. I think I need to light one up. <laughs> oh! Dinky Dow, Dawa Mesk. Jamba Weed is totes the best. Slowly, Mandusa added his knowledge to the ever-expanding tapestry before them, weaving mighty threads of spatial truth. Yeah, but if space is nothing too, then, like, we're also nothing. And that, like, totally sucks, dude. Children of the Wasteland. Maybe in the end, we're all just, just like, ghosts? In a warlock's dream? Dude, why would you even say that? That's so fucking scary. To live is to be afraid. And he was right. Truth, my friend. 
truth. Come on, man. You sound like my dad. Dude, yeah, your dad. Your dad's tight. Mandusa, his mortal brain overcome with otherworldly knowledge, began fading from this temporal realm into the next. Staring into the nexus of all realities, Ben traveled inward. Individualism is a very Western idea. But then, without it, space would be like the Weeniverse. We are the universe. 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 <sighs> Worn thin by the knowledge bombs of truth dropping all around him, Ben's eyes slowly rolled back in his head, as if trying to look inward for even more self-wisdom. A seemingly supernatural passage of time commenced, until in some far-flung reality he transcendentally awoke. Oh, shit. Before him, just beyond the veil of hazy Kentucky blue, stood a peculiar figure the likes of which Ben had never seen before. It was a man, or was it? Pale of face and long of tunic, with cat-like sigils unknown and runic, he stood with spear and dress of chain, a long-lost warrior, so dope, man. <sighs> oh. Was he friend or foe, or just here to toke? It was then the mustached specter spoke. Wise master, I, Don Wheeler of the Order of Cats, seek a worthy suitor for my hot, hot daughter. A comfy Ben on beaned bag then smiled soft and began to sag. This chill, chill ghost seemed pretty tight. A freestyle like this one could go all night. The ghost went on. She is fertile, 420 friendly, and extremely open-minded. What? Also, a huge show is coming to Castle Cat, and if you are down to jam, we are in dire need of base. Okay. The ghost then changed like something strange. His clothes and face did rearrange. He stood now in Brandon's wildcat coat, then spoke forth so grateful, and I quote, Thanks be to you, bra, for this grand gesture. Truly, young lord, you must be the coolest guy we know. Ben rested back with a comfy smile. How long had he been here? Had it been a while? Time means nothing in the world of smoke. Now whiskered, the gilded ghost then spoke. You fucking rock, dude. Ben sat in the cloud like a Bobo Bush boss, when suddenly Don's spear became a stick for the cross. His eyes then grew slitted, and his whiskers grew long. Something was happening. Something was wrong. Cat. Through the cloud, said the tripping young Ben. Meow, said the ghost in a feline-like zen. It's a cat. Ben replied with dark realization. Meow meow, spoke the cat man with dark resignation. Fearful, Ben stood there with wide growing eyes. Meow meow meow, winked the cat through the dank mist of lies. Ah, cat, it's a cat. Dude, what's a cat? Spoke Mandusa, now awake from his slumber. Back to the world of the real with a mind unencumbered. But Ben had no answer for what had transpired. He was too full of primo, and so very tired. Who was that ghost, and why don't we know him? And why did this issue turn into a poem? So many questions, like what are my hands? Just ten lonely fingers from faraway lands. Somehow I started this poem, and now I can't stop it. I found this great rhyme scheme, and now I can't drop it. I can't go back to normal, I'm trapped in the stanza! Was it the Jamaican gold weed, or the Portuguese ganza? I guess I'll just end this and try some more later. If I can get back to normal, chapter 15 will sound greater. Anyways, that was chapter 14. Let's call it a wrap.
I'd, uh, I'd hang out with you more. <laughs> but for now, I should nap. Yeah, so, there you go. <laughs> that, mm. that was a small preview of the, of the audiobook. The entire book will not be a poem. Yeah. <laughs> Just three parts. Yeah, it's, it's, the whole thing's not a poem. Uh. But that's a part of it. So, there you go. Yes, Portuguese Ganza. If you uh, want to check out the the whole thing, you can still back us on the Kickstarter. Yeah. So you can go to stevelichman.com or click the link below the video here. And uh, you see that button. It's ending October 31st. So you can check it out. And uh, the audiobook exists on its own. So even if you don't get the book, like if for some reason you like that... <laughs> You yeah. you could technically just listen to that. I also want to say, not to spoil anything, but the audiobook is its own story that isn't in the comic, where the narrator starts as a normal narrator, and by the end of the comic, it's completely different. Yeah, yeah, it's Everything, its own story. That was chapter 14, so it's kind of right in the middle, but by the end of the book, it's not even the same thing as the beginning. He completely changes yeah we literally wrote a whole nother book's worth of material for the audiobook so you can He's tell got his own narrative yeah like you can tell that that issue has its own like it has it's double the issue <laughs> because of the narrator yeah. so yeah right there you go you still drawn uh no i figured we'd we'd get off of here because i gotta get back to doing other stuff yeah i want to put the audiobook out tomorrow if we can i got a prep some stuff to ship out to Canada, but I uh, might be up. So if you backed it, uh, I'll be sending two emails, one from the Kickstarter and one through the mailing list. So sorry for the double email, but it's the only way to make sure people actually get the email. But, but yeah. Yeah. Thanks everybody for hanging out. Thanks everybody thanks for who supported. <laughs> sorry. You lose trying to get into the mic. <laughs> thanks to everybody who supported the Kickstarter so far. Really appreciate it. And if you'd like a copy of the book, please uh you know get the link below the video and you can pre-order the books as well as get copies of the audiobooks of volume one and two and yep. the audiobooks are crazy long this one's like six hours and it's the, only yeah, it's the almost six hours it's gonna be like 10 pretty much it's gonna be under yeah. that but you know yeah long. it's gonna be it might be over 10 we don't really know yet yeah Based on how long this one was compared to the script, it's probably going to be nine or ten hours for book two's audiobook. Yeah, and if uh, you've already purchased a book and you'd like to help us spread the word, please share that the Kickstarter's live. We'd really appreciate that. It would mean a lot to us because, you know, we can only do so much with our our own resources. So we love you. Arigato. Very, very true. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Stay beautiful. Later. Stay cream. Team cream. Cash out. Hello, YouTube. Oh, YouTube, we're back. I never thought those guys would leave. Finally, it's just us again. I know. We don't. We don't <sighs> care too much for that stuff, you know? No. Being on no. Twitch. We're here for trash. the two. It's all trash. We're here for YouTube, you know? But anyways, YouTube, thanks for sitting through all that to get back to, you know, the intimate time with just the two of us. But yeah, you know. thanks for hanging through that. I hope you like the audiobook preview. And you again, know, Steve you know, if you want to help us spread the word, for, hopefully, you know, get the word out there. Help us spread the word. Come on. We need it. We need it. We're not going to beg, but we will. We'll beg. Please. Please. I have children now. Our lives depend on it. Dave's married. He's got one in the oven. I got a kid with... Is that what that means? I have that a, means? I have a kid with no toes. Oh, okay. No toes. I need that toe money. Do you hear me? <laughs> I got to put my kid through school without toes. Ten toes. Ten toes, no cash. Please help. Yeah, ten toes. It's actually his name. Ten toe Raposa? Yeah, he's a Native American. Sounds racist, but it actually isn't.
See, it's not Tonto. It's and ten that's what toes. We've you know, that's a great way to close. To, that's really what we've learned tonight on this stream. It's not Sounds racist, but isn't. It's not racist if you don't believe it. Is that how it works? Good night. Good night, everybody.